If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, people who have heard or had encounters with folklore, legends, fairies, myths, missing 411, and other phenomena, tell us your most unnerving stories. I'm fairly sure it resides in or around the house we live in. It likes to mimic things in the house. Multiple times we have seen duplicates of our cat, which is usually what it does. However, it has tried to copy our corgi a few times and couldn't get it right. The end result was an anthropomorphic corgi-like form. The first time I saw it, it looked as surprised that I saw it as I was to be seeing it. I've heard that Faye doesn't like being talked about, so when I do talk about it verbally, like clockwork, it will wake our one-year-old in the middle of the night, otherwise she sleeps like a log, lol. I'm hoping that since I'm saying this, it won't mind or won't know. My friends and I went out one night to the hills in Lakeside, California, a suburb of San Diego, looking for a supposed screaming tree. We were in this field walking around different creepy looking trees, and one buddy took another aside and started whispering. The rest of us were getting creeped out by this, so we asked what the hell they were talking about, and just then one of them yelled out toward a hill about 100 yards away. Excuse me. Should we not be here? Silence. If we aren't supposed to be here, we can leave. The rest of us turned to look, and there's this dark figure traversing the hill, it had to be 12 feet tall, and the steps it was taking were massive. It stops and looks down at us, and just then another friend exclaims, what the duck is that? And he points to a tree about 20 yards away from us, and another similar figure looks like it's hiding behind the tree and staring at us. The figure on the hill started walking toward us, and I don't think any of us had ever run so fast in our lives back to the car and hauled asses out of there. The night was clear, and it was a full moon, so it was weird that they were just dark, with no features whatsoever. My partner and I have had many experiences. Background info is that my partner is a mixed ethnicity of Irish and Native American and is knowledgeable and in touch with both of his family's cultures. Continuing, he was 15 years old, 12 years ago, and was out riding his bike to a friend's on a beautiful sunny day. From his left, he saw what he at first thought was a very large butterfly fly towards him. The flying creature kept up with him at his biking pace and flew in front of his face. It hovered there and made eye contact with him. That's when he realized he was looking into the eyes of a tiny human with beautiful wings. He said it had slender arms and legs, a thin torso clothed in a type of fabric, and a small human face with a noticeably tiny pointed nose that seemed to be female. After holding his gaze a second longer, it just flew away. He said it was a cool experience because it left him feeling really happy and good the rest of the day. No drugs involved, FYI, I always loved the idea of fairies as a kid but never saw any, perhaps my partner did because they are part of Irish folklore? Anyway, that's his short tale. When I was about 20, I was staying at my boyfriend's mom's house one night. I was a little sleep deprived, as we had been out the night before. I decided to go upstairs for a nap, and I woke up some hours later to darkness. The full moon was shining through the window, and suddenly there was rustling and movement everywhere in the room. As I tried to see what it was that was moving, I started to see tiny beings coming from all around the curtains and kind of bungying down the glass onto the floor. There were voices, and they sounded excited. I sat up, terrified, and made a run for it down the stairs. I remember being a little embarrassed to say what had happened to freak me out so much, but when I relayed my story to my boyfriend's mom, she just smiled and told me, oh, that's nothing to worry about. Every morning, when I get up, I open the back door and invite the fairies in. I was walking my dog, a black and white pity slash retriever mix, outside before putting him to bed around 11 p.m. It's very dark, as there are a lot of wooded areas around my apartment complex. I usually walk him about half a mile or so out of the complex to a stop sign and light post at the end of the street, which borders on the woods. Usually there is nothing out of the ordinary, just wood and normal animals like squirrels and the occasional deer. Sometimes there's that weird, heavy feeling like something is watching you intently, but I mostly ignore it, and we cut our walk short and head home since a brief scan of the area shows nothing is there. Tonight there was that heavy, watched feeling again, but when I scanned the woods, there was something there. A dog with glowing yellow eyes that looked exactly like my dog, down to the heart-shaped white spot on his chest, stood just past the tree line, staring directly at us. It looked like it could be his twin, but there was just something off about it that invoked that feeling of run. My dog definitely saw it too and was whining and staring at it hard. Usually my dog is reactive to other large dogs, but he seemed more scared than anything else and wanted to get away, which is very abnormal behavior for him. After seeing it, I fought that run feeling and walked quickly but casually back into the gated area and home without looking back but listening very hard for anything coming behind or to the sides of us. Instinctively, 
It felt like the safest thing to do, I don't know why. It seemed like it didn't follow, but who knows. I do know that I will be skipping nighttime walks for a while, that's for sure. Any ideas on what that might have been? A fairy ring has been growing in my backyard around my tree. I know the lore behind the fairy rings. And I said, you know what? Duck it, let's see if it's legit or not. I sat in the ring of mushrooms for about 5 minutes before I got bored and got up. Nothing happened. This morning I woke up and noticed this black mass just chilling in my room on my ceiling with these multicolored lights, kind of like a spider. It was there for about 5 minutes, just chilling there. Which just so happens to be coincidental with the time frame I sat in the fairy ring. I figured getting abducted by the fae was better than working a 40 hour work week. Anyone have any experiences like this after sitting in a fairy ring? This story has many different versions, but it all links to an orb that you can spot on a road in between Francisville and Rensselaer, in Indiana, of course. This orb of light can change color rapidly, which supposedly shows the mood of the ghost. There are many different versions of this story, but the most bone-chilling to me was this one. A man and his wife lived on a farm right by this exact road I just mentioned. One day, during a severe snowstorm, the wife left the farm and never came back. The man didn't know where she was, so he went searching for her in the snowstorm and met his end there as well. The legend is that this light is the man searching for his wife, or at least the version I was told. This light is real. However, the point of this is to ask if any of you think this light is actually a ghost or just something odd. You can find a few videos of the light on the internet as well, in case you don't believe my claims. New Jersey is here. The most famous one, for obvious reasons, is the Jersey Devil. The other two I know of are the Devil's Tree. Somewhere out in Kingwood, I think, is a tree that's been used for hangings and murders. Supposedly, someone at some point, a few times in history, has tried to cut this tree down, but every time they try to, their tool breaks. The axe breaks in half, and chainsaw teeth are shattered on impact, and legend has it that it bleeds when you try. It also kills you if you try to cut it down. The second one is Pig Lady Road. Out in, Raritan? There's a manor that is closed off and permanently private property. It's said that there was a family that was there, parents and a daughter, that had pigs on the property. The daughter loved the pigs, but her parents hated that she would only spend time with the pigs. So they eventually tossed her in a trash bag and threw her in the pen, and they ate her. Now it's said if you go to the road, lane, most people call it, turn your engine off, flash your headlights three times, and say pig lady? It's been a while, she'll appear and chase you with an axe. She has the head of a pig and the body of a human female. This is very common. Do not worry, you are not alone. I once had a friend, and when he was 7 years old, I was 6 years old. I'm now 23. We used to meet at his house, then walk to the playground. At about 4 to 5 p.m., we would leave for 2 hours. Looking back at it, our parents weren't very responsible. We weren't very smart, even for 6 and 7 year olds. I had spotted it very often. It is the black stick man. He seemed to follow us wherever we went. Very large in size, from a foot to a dozen. He soon told me he had been seeing it or them too. When I was 9, he died, and the stick man went away. At 22 years old, I bought a computer, only now have I researched what this is. There is a video of it scaling a wall. I found four other people in half an hour, and I am making this to inform you that you are not alone. They are some sort of grim reaper. Please leave a comment if you have been experiencing similar problems. I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains, in southwestern Pennsylvania. My specific mountain was White Horse Mountain. White Horse Mountain got its name from the earliest variety of urban legend. The story goes that there was a fight between the tribe that originally settled the mountain and the colonists that eventually took over. During this fight, one of the tribal warriors was killed and knocked from his horse. The pure white stallion had been raised by the warrior from a colt, and the warrior had never once fallen from him. He did not understand what happened or where his warrior went. Other members of the tribe tried to recapture it but failed. So the white horse spent the rest of its life wandering the mountain, hoping to find his partner. And as the story goes, he didn't stop after death. On foggy mornings, you can hear the hoof steps and neighs of the white horse continuing his search. Sometimes, if the fog is particularly thick, you will be able to see the vague shape of the stallion in the distance, but you will never get close enough to see him clearly. My family is from the Panhandle of Texas, far east of Amarillo. My great-grandfather came from Ireland and brought a lot of that folklore with him. He had a college education in a time when that was not the norm, so he was a very smart man. Long story short, 
he started leaving milk and bread out for the fay. He was Catholic, and this was apparently something normal for him, and his mother had done the same. But it got out of hand because the bread would double and the milk would overflow out of the bowl every night. Eventually he saw some Tinkerbell-type winged creature in the back acreage, which freaked him out. This thing had red eyes and was able to telepathically talk to him. He had a priest come from Pampa to bless his property, and he never saw anything weird again. I married my great-grandmother, and no other strange things happened. Aguane Fairies of the Austrian Alps The Aguane are female fairies living among the Austrian Alps, in northern Italy, and on the borders of Slovenia. They are shapeshifters, but their true form is that of a beautiful young woman with long hair and either goats or horses' feet. They are particularly known as guardians of rivers and mountain streams, and it is advisable to ask their permission before setting foot in any such water. If a man enters the water and stirs up the mud of the stream bed, the Aguane may come forth and attack him. While they have been known to eat human beings who trespass in their water, they are also known to be fond of children, whom they carry on their shoulders across rivers. Has anyone ever encountered portals? I remember one of my friends, I'm from Alaska, telling me about how he was hiking with an old friend from middle school. In the summer months in Alaska, it does not start to get dark until maybe 3 or 4 a.m. He said he was walking up a ridge to get back to their truck when he saw a large circular stone. He said it was about the size of a hockey net laid on its side, and a sort of buzzing, humming sound coming from the grove of spruce that surrounded it. He detailed to me how there were also leaves twirling around violently on the ground when it wasn't windy at all. He obviously didn't want to get closer and never did, and he and his friend hauled asses out of there. He said he just had an uneasy feeling and was starting to feel sick, probably nerves. I don't know what to think of this. If anyone else has similar stories and can maybe have an answer to what this was, that would be great. It's just scary to think that he and his friend could have been another missing 411 case. The Legend of the Donkey Lady Bridge There are many variations of the story, but the ending always ends with a disfigured woman, due to fire or by being born disfigured, that resembles a donkey. She is said to haunt the bridge. If you park and honk, then exit your car to walk along the bridge, you may get a glimpse of her or hear hoof clops. Some have said their cars are damaged with scratches or have hoof prints on them when they return. Others say they see a figure with a donkey's head. My aunt said she visited in a two-door car with some friends. As they exited the car, the seat had to be folded forward to let the back passenger out. They left the door open and the seat folded, this was in the 1970s. They decided to be brave and explore the area. They began hearing strange noises, like a donkey bray. They went back to the car, and there was a perfect dusty hoof print on the back of the folded seat. On a sad note, a friend of mine was killed on the bridge when we were in our first year of high school. A different friend of mine had a story about how he and another schoolmate of ours were driving in the area of the bridge. My friend reminded our schoolmate how he had been a bully to the deceased. He started saying he didn't care and used profanity toward the deceased. At that moment, my friend swears the head of a hellish horse or donkey appeared in the driver window with red eyes. It was a fleeting moment. He seemed so sincere and frightened when he told that story. We have Spanish missions in the area around our river. One story is that if you see the ghost of a monk and he looks at you, you will die soon. It gives me the creeps when driving by the river at night. There are many more, but these are two interesting ones. This story also took place in El Salvador. There's this woman they call La Suanaba. This woman is known to lure men who tend to be out late at night and unfaithful ones as well. She lures men with her attributes. She's been seen practically nude from the top. As she lures them with her body, she takes them away with her to a lonely place and eventually ends up turning into a skull from her face. She starts laughing when she scares them, and a lot of men have ended up crazy and even dead after having encounters with her. This one time, my cousin and his girlfriend decided to meet up at a spot late at night. They agreed to see each other after everyone was asleep, which was around midnight. My cousin was waiting for his girlfriend when, from far away, he noticed a woman covering her face. My cousin figured it was his girlfriend hiding her face so nobody would see her sneaking out. He walks up to her and starts caressing her, and out of nowhere, he turns to look at her face and notices her face as a skull. He pushes her away, and that's when he notices she's nude and not his girl. He started running back home, and from far away, he said that as he was running, he heard her laughing so loudly at him, saying that she had him. He said he never again wanted to go out at night. The next day, he told his girlfriend, and she assured him it wasn't her. She wasn't able to sneak out due to her parents staying up late that night. There is this Finnish urban legend about something called Niatimis. Niati is a bundle that is tied to a stick and then carried over one's shoulder, so the literal translation of Niatimis would be something like a bundleman. 
The op is hiking and fishing somewhere in eastern Lapland, Finland. Op has been lucky with fishing, and just for the fun of it, he wraps them in a cloth and makes a bundle to carry over his shoulder. He gets a little bit lost on his way back, but finds a small road. He can't find the road on his map, but he figures that the road will eventually get him somewhere where he can ask for help. After a while, he sees an older man walking on the road. The man has a gun in his hand and points it at Op as soon as he sees him, demanding Op stop. What do you have in your bundle? The man with the gun asks, and the Op answers truthfully, it's just some fish. The man then wants to see the fish before he finally puts his gun down. The Op describes that the man looks somehow relieved after checking the bundle and recalls being very confused about the situation. He thinks that the man is probably someone raising reindeer, so just walking out there in the middle of nowhere is not really that strange but usually these people are very friendly and chatty. The man then asks the op whether he has a gun with him or not. Op doesn't have one, he is there just for fishing, it's not normal to carry a gun around in Finland, people do that usually only when hunting, and you need to have a permit. When the man hears this, he tells op that he will walk op to a larger road that will take op to the closest village. He seems very rushed and tells op that he needs to get out of the woods as soon as possible. Op is very confused and is starting to get very scared. When the op asks why they are in such a rush, the man tells him that he is not the only soul coming from the direction where the op is coming from. They arrive at the bigger road. Before departing, the old man grabs his hand. If you see someone in the road with a bundle similar to yours, you best pray that the bundle is full. You don't want to know what's in there, but as long as it is full, you should be alright. If it asks you something, don't answer, and under no circumstances, do not ask about the bundle. If it comes closer, you need to pray like crazy and close your eyes. That will be at least a little better. At this point, Op is terrified but still skeptical of the tales that the old man is telling him. At first, he is making his way towards the village by walking, but after a little while, he suddenly gets very anxious and starts running. Op keeps looking back to make sure that the road is and stays empty. He can't run for long with everything he is carrying with him, but even when walking, he tries to keep his pace as fast as possible. The forest seems to be completely quiet all of a sudden. This time, when Op looks back, he sees it. Tall, slender figure that seems to be carrying a bundle on his shoulder. It is still quite far away, but Op doesn't want to wait for it to get closer. He drops everything and starts running. Op writes that he doesn't recall anything from that point to finally arriving at the village. He doesn't look back even once. Op runs to the first house and knocks on the door. Luckily, some woman opens the door immediately, as if she had been waiting behind the door for him to knock, and lets him in. The op tries to explain what happened, but the woman doesn't seem to be too surprised. She is looking out from a window, and when op takes a look, he sees it. It is standing still on the road, looking straight at the house. I am so glad that I got away, op says. You didn't get away. It just had its bundle full. But it didn't get to me. I was way ahead. I was watching you from the window. It was right behind you the whole time. This is quite a direct translation of the most popular Niatimi story circulating on the internet. And even my grandpa seems to know the story. My grandparents have a summer cottage in Lapland. When we were little, my grandparents would take us kids there, me and my older brother, sometimes our cousin, every summer. When we were a little bit older, my grandpa told us scary horror stories that mostly took place in Lapland. My grandma had to stop him sometimes when we were too scared to even go to sleep after hearing these stories. Many of them involve something called Nyitit. As I have explained before, Nyiti can be translated to bundle, but the word is rare enough that, on its own, without context, I didn't even make the connection to bundles. I just thought it was the name of those beings. In these stories, Nyiti wasn't a completely coherent concept but rather just this evil spirit kind of thing that wandered in the forests. One particular story about it eating the souls of those lost in the wilderness has stayed with me. Back to the present. Me and a few of my friends decided to visit my grandparents' cottage last weekend just to have a nice vacation on our own. One of my friends, Laura, wanted to bring her boyfriend Topi with us as well, so in total there were three girls and one guy. The first day was just an ordinary, chill day. The second evening, we warmed up in the sauna and decided to go ice swimming on the lake. After we girls got back from the sauna, Topi asked us if we had seen anything out of the ordinary when we were walking back from the sauna, the sauna is in a separate building near the water, about 100 meters from the main building where we were sleeping, he told us that he had seen someone or something standing on the road, watching us make our way back to the cottage. He told us that it looked like it had something hanging from its shoulder, but it was far enough away to not see it clearly. I remembered the story of Niatimis, and I was sure that he knew it as well and was just trying to scare us. 
The girls all laughed, but he wouldn't admit it, on the contrary, he seemed to be adamant about seeing something in there. We forgot the whole thing as the night went on. The cottage is quite small, there was a sofa bed in the main room and some mattresses on a loft above it. Laura and Topi took the sofa, and me and the other friend slept in the loft. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, I was woken up by a crying Laura. She was shushing me to be quiet, it's not nice to be woken up in the middle of the night, so I might have sworn or something, and to come look out from the window with her. Topi was already awake and looked just as scared as Laura. Apparently, Laura had woken up to go to the toilet and seen something on the road on her way back, lots of these older cottages still have the outhouse toilet without running water. It had looked just like Topi had described it, although it was dark outside, so she didn't get a good look. Suddenly, the thing had started to run, maybe fly would be a better word, toward Laura. Laura said that it was unnaturally fast. Laura ran back to the cottage and locked the door behind her. She then woke up, first Topi, and then us. Sure enough, when we peeked from the window outside, I was almost shitting myself, I was so scared, we saw it. It just stood there, a few meters from the cottage, and was looking straight at us. It had the bundle over its shoulder, just like it had been described. I am pretty sure the bundle had something in it, I had to look because I remembered the stories about the Niatimis. After some time, it just turned and went away, straight to the forest. We didn't sleep at all that night. In the morning, I called my grandpa and told him what had happened. He told us to immediately pack our bags and drive away without looking back, so that's what we did. It could have been just some random creepy dude, but why? But I have never been as scared as I was then. It's been almost a week, but it still scares me shitless. I am certain of what I saw, and the others are as well. I know I sound paranoid and insane, but for real, a lot of people get lost in the wilderness. I think I might have really seen the Niatimis last weekend. Last night, as I was driving home, around 55 miles per hour tilde, I noticed something roughly human-shaped running behind my car. There were no other cars on the road, and it was in the country. Hell, I only even checked my back mirror with nobody else around because deer are known to pop out of nowhere this late. Needless to say, I kept glancing back at this thing. It took me like 5 minutes before I passed under a streetlight, at which point it vanished. The Midwestern slash Great Lakes area is known for some freaky urban legends and such, but I've never really experienced anything quite like this in my life here. I am really freaked out and need to share. This happened in North Queensland, Australia, near my family property, about 20 kilometers from the small town we live in. It was somewhere around 8.30 pm, and it was dark out. My partner and I were driving down the dirt road, which is the street that my place is situated on. We were returning to the place where we are sitting, which is only a 5 to 10 minute drive away. We were approaching the intersection just about to leave this dirt road and turn off onto the main sealed road when a car passed, driving along the main road at, I assume, the speed limit or over, which is about 80 to 100 kilometers per hour. But then a black creature appeared, running on all fours. It seemed to be chasing after the car, and I caught it briefly in my headlights as it sprinted past. My car is old, and my headlights aren't the brightest, unfortunately, so all we could make out was a black shape going fast. It was the size of a large dog and was almost keeping up with the car, which didn't register with me until my boyfriend pointed it out after the incident. I began to turn my car to try to catch it in my headlights again, wondering if it was a dog that the people in the car had dumped by the road, but in addition to it being far gone already, my partner became tense and urged me to keep driving and speed up. I asked why, still not really realizing that this thing was way too fast to be a big cat, feral pig, or dog, and he said it could be something scary. Like, what? I replied. A kudachi, maybe, he said. And then he pointed out how fast it was. Now spooked and finally driving off at a fair speed, I then asked what a kudachi, not sure of spelling, he pronounced it kudai chi, was, and he said he didn't want to talk about it. Now frightened, I kept looking back in my rear view every time we went under a street light to check that this thing wasn't following us now. We made it to the housekeeping place safely, and when I asked him again, he just replied that it was some sort of spirit. I don't think he knew anything more. I naturally searched it, thinking it would come up on a list of aboriginal folklore spirits or something, but got nothing. Anyone have any ideas? There are a lot of different entities in the world of Australian aboriginal mythology, so I know it could be a long shot. This story happened in 2007, and it gets told every time my family gets together. My nana owns a farm, and she has always had a herd of cows and a guard donkey. In one of her cattle fields, there used to be a large circle of mushrooms that my nana said was a fairy circle. Now, my nana is Irish, 
and Irish people don't mess with fairies, and she refused to even mow over the circle. When she married my stepfather, he didn't believe in fairies or the paranormal, and he wanted to remove the circle from the field, but my nana told him not to. He thought that she was being silly, and they would argue about it all of the time. Long story short, he went behind her back and had the fairy circle removed while she was away. When she found out what he did, she refused to talk to him for days and was very angry and upset. Two weeks after the circle was removed, all of her currently pregnant cows aborted their calves. My nana was devastated since she is very experienced and careful with looking after her cows, and she had never lost all of her calves before, it hasn't happened since. She had lost one or two, but never all of them. There was also a strange, scary experience involving me that my nana believes was also connected. A few weeks after it happened, my mom and one-year-old me stayed with my nana for a few days to cheer her up, since she was upset about the calves. Somehow, I ended up catching chicken pox, which is supposed to be rare in babies under one. Luckily, I wasn't too sick, but it still scared everyone. I know that my nana still put small offerings in the cattle field, like small cakes and barley water, even though my step-granddad still thinks it's silly. I've stayed at her farm a lot, and the field definitely has a different feel to it that I've never felt anywhere else. Especially at night, and I would never stay outside after dark. I know it was probably just two random coincidences, but it's become a legend in my family. If you just search for Goatman, it's not just a recent, scary internet story. It's a legend about a cryptid that apparently started in Maryland in the 1950s. Also, the internet says that there's a local legend about the Goatman that originally started in Oregon. When I was a kid, my family used to go camping a lot. We had an RV, and my sister and I would sleep in the top part above the driving compartment, I don't remember what that area is called, but it's higher up and hangs over the driver's seat. One night, when I was about 6 or 7, I woke up because I had to pee. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye and looked out the little porthole window. I couldn't see the torso clearly, but I could see the head, arms, and legs. I thought it was a deer at first, standing on its back legs. I remember its head being massive. I always tell people it was a deer head, but reading about goat man, it could have been a large goat. Anyway, its limbs were very long and very thin, making it tall enough for its head to be about eye level with me in the trailer. I remember its arms being out to the sides and bent up at the elbow, its wrists limp, and its hands kind of flapping slowly, both of them twitchy and out of sync with each other, as if it were upset by something. For some reason, it's the hands that stick out to me the most now and terrified me then. Perhaps because when I noticed them, I realized that it wasn't a deer. It was just staring at the RV for several seconds, then it pulled its arms back against its chest, lowered its head, hunched its back, and limped away. No one else saw it, so of course the family wrote it off as a nightmare. Holy crap. Back in 2005, when I was younger, my cousin was killed due to falling in love with a girl whose father did not like him because of his ethnicity, my cousin and I are Mexican. Around the time he died, either a short while after he died or a short while before he died, I was very young when this experience happened. Me, my mother, my father, and one of my tios were outside at night just to talk and spend time together. I live in California, in a city where you can see various kinds of trees. My mother said, look, a lechusa. It must be about your cousin. When we all looked, I saw a barn on top of those very tall pineish trees. At the time, I said, what? Let us can't fly? Lechusa sounds like lechuga, my mom said that when you see one, it means someone is going to die or has died. I haven't told many people about this, apart from my best friend and close friends, but I have recently been drawn to them, the lechuzas. Can this mean anything? Mexican, Latino, or Hispanic people, have any answers or tips? Last summer, me and my brother took a walk through the woods at Silver Fall State Park in Oregon. The forests were beautiful and cool, so we figured why not and took a path into the trees. We were pretty far down the path when it happened. Our cabins were far out of view and out of earshot, and we had just turned a corner and began going up the side of a cliff when my brother froze. I asked him what was wrong, and he was near tears as he told me he wanted to go back. We jogged back to the cabins, and he told me he saw a black streak that was the shape of a human, with a long nose, bald head, and skinny limbs, dashing silently through the trees. I've never seen my brother in this state. He was crying and shaking. I've been thinking about it, could it have been a cryptid? Maybe whatever that was, if it wasn't just my brother's imagination, is what snatches up people in the blink of an eye in 411 cases? I'd love to hear any ideas or similar experiences. Thanks. My wife had an encounter when she was a child with what she describes as little people. 
This was about 20 minutes outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the late 80s. There are plenty of Cherokees that live in Oklahoma, but the only mention I have ever found of little people around here is Mohawk little people. Also, as someone else mentioned, the legend of the Deer Lady is around here too. When my wife was under 10 years old and lived in a bit of a rural area. The properties weren't huge or anything, but enough for a small pond here and there, to name a few. She said it was right at dusk, and she was walking back from her neighbor's house, who had children the same age she was friends with. Their houses were about the length of three football fields apart, and with a pond, you have to walk around close to her house. At one end of the pond, there have always been little holes, like rabbit dens or something. She said when she got to them, she thought she heard sounds like talking but couldn't make it out, then started walking a little faster because it scared her. When she was halfway between the pond and her house, she looked back and could see three small humanoid creatures no bigger than a foot to a foot and a half tall, and they were moving towards her, making her feel threatened. She said she started to run towards the house, screaming for her parents. She made it in and told her parents what she saw, and they went out to look and see if they were still there, but of course there were no signs of them at all. Her parents still live in the house, and there are still little holes in that same area, but they have never encountered anything like that again. I would normally write something like this off as a child's imagination, but her parents both believe her, and they are a couple of the most serious, no bullshit type of people I know. Also, one of my wife's most annoying traits is that she is truthful to a fault, and it's completely against her character to make something like this up. The thing that really makes this believable to me is that she has absolutely no other stories about anything out of the ordinary ever happening. She had never even heard about the local legend of the Mohawk little people until we had been dating for a while, and I was having dinner with her family when her mom brought up the story. This was about three years ago in Big Bend National Park. My friend, my husband, and I were all going on a trip to do some primitive camping. I'm not a hardcore camper, but I've done my share of primitive camping and hiking, so I like to think I have some wilderness sense. I know what common animals are like after growing up on eight acres of forested land. Coyotes were frequent visitors, so I know how creepy they can sound. That's why I know what we encountered that night was something else. We arrived at Big Bend around 4 p.m., checked in, and set up our tent at our campsite, Nine Point Draw. It's a pretty desolate location around the entrance to the park. The campsite is about 25 miles from the visitor center and lodge and about 40 miles from the Rio Grande village. So we were not near any kind of civilization that I know of. We had the idea that we would go for a night hike to a nearby trail after having dinner that night. So in preparation, I decided to scout out the trail from our campsite. The terrain in this part of the camp is totally flat desert with some ground vegetation, so we thought it would be an easy route from our campsite to the trail. The trek from our campsite was not difficult, but as an added precaution, I put up rock piles for us to follow that night. After dinner, we decided to head out around 10 p.m. The first 10 minutes were pretty uneventful, but we were all in good spirits. Suddenly, we hear a scuttling noise from about 50 feet away behind us. Having been used to animal noises at night, we wrote it off as a critter. A few minutes later, we heard the same noise, a bit closer and sounding like a bigger animal. There are black bears here, but we weren't in the area where they're normally sighted. Like I said, the landscape was wide open, and we didn't see anything with our flashlights. We were a bit uneasy, but willing to go on. The rock piles had been doing a good job of leading in the right direction. All at once, I stopped, feeling absolute terror. It's an indescribable feeling, I see many others in the subreference. I knew we were in danger, I just didn't know why. I looked at my friend and my husband, who both looked as terrified as I felt. There was no sound, no wind, and then, in an instant, the most inhuman scream erupted, seemingly all around us. We all froze for what felt like minutes, but I'm sure it was just seconds. I don't remember making the decision to run back, but the next thing I remember, we were all running. We had made it pretty far out, even though I thought I was running in the direction of our camp. I remember scanning for the rock piles I had made but not being able to find any and almost turning back, thinking we were headed in the wrong direction, but I had this instinct not to. We made it to a rather large rock, which I knew was on the route back to the campsite. I also remembered putting a rock pile beside the rock. I went to check if it was there to make sure we were headed back to our campsite. The rocks were still there, but they had been knocked over. This set off all the alarms, and I told my friend and my husband that we had to get back to the camp as soon as possible. We made it back a few minutes later, and by the time we got back, I was entirely freaked out and didn't want to stay. I think my husband was as well, but my friend convinced us that it was just wildlife. So we stayed in the tent that night. I don't know if it was connected, but there was scuttling and footsteps around the tent all night. Either way, I did not sleep. 
we did not do any more primitive hiking that trip and opted instead for a campsite in one of the community camps. I've never felt that feeling before or since, and I've been in the woods at night plenty of times. The next day, I went out to check if all the rock piles had been knocked down. They had. I don't think an animal would deliberately go around knocking over the markers. That's what really makes me think it was sentient. I don't know what it was, but I don't want to know, and I'm glad we made it out. There is a legend out there in British Columbia about the lost lights. Apparently, some hikers back in the late 1800s were hiking in the mountains in BC. All of a sudden, a huge storm hit. The hikers got separated from each other and got lost on the mountain. The storm killed the hikers, and their bodies were never found. Legend has it that they have become a death omen. Apparently, if you are hiking with a group of people in BC and you see lights, like lantern lights, on the mountain, however many lights you see, that is how many people are going to die from a major storm that is going to hit. I was wondering if anyone here knows any more about this legend or ghost story that they can add. If you know the full story, please share it. This is not fiction, there were a group of people who died in the mountains of BC in the 1800s, and apparently people have seen strange lights in the mountain wilderness of BC right before a storm has hit. Can anyone who has knowledge of this legend please tell me what they know? I heard this legend once before, and I was wondering if someone could fill in the details. When I was a child, around five, I had a best friend who absolutely loved the idea of fairies and had the most colorful imagination of anyone I can remember. A child having an imagination around the idea of fairies sounds normal and everything, and I thought it was normal and fun at the time, but of all the memories I have of our times talking about fairies, trying to find fairies, or anything to do with it, I remember it with an otherworldly feeling of uneasiness and extreme discomfort. When I say this girl was into it, she was into it. She truly, 100% believed these fairies were real, and I followed her along with it until we started to part ways at around age 11 or so. I've never seen someone be so passionate about something. I cannot remember any memories of any encounters, but all I do remember is that sense of feeling something is not right, extremely not right. Not with her, but just the subject matter, I guess. I'll continue this with a little more information about the girl's family. They've been a notoriously unlucky family for generations, disease, death, poverty, strange situations, anything and everything under the moon. When she and I were around seven, I think she and her family moved to a lone trailer in a rural field. A lot of strange things happened there, and I witnessed the only time I've ever truly known that I've seen a spirit, a shadow of a small Native American boy sneaking down the hallway. I watched his shadow cross in front of the doorway to the room I was in. A lot of other nasty things happened to this family at this house. Not long after, it burned to the ground. Thankfully, everyone was okay. But when cleaning up the wreckage, horse bones and Native American artifacts were found. So, to get back to the woods idea, I've lived in the middle of nowhere in the woods in a log cabin my whole life. I have a lovely relationship with the woods now, and I love it. But strangely, as a child, my memories of the woods were plagued with just weird, strange, uneasy feelings. A lot of my childhood feels like that, but most notably these things. My older brother's experiences he has had with duendes, aka Mexican-styled goblins. Duendes are creatures from Iberian, Latin American, and Filipino folklore. They could be very mischievous or nice. It really depends on your actions toward it. They can dwell in the woods or even in your house. It's said that they can live inside your walls as well. But now that I've explained a little bit about duendes, let's get into the experiences. So, my oldest brother, P, moved out three or four years ago. When he did live with my family and me, he never had any problems with these goblins. Only when he got mixed up with people who did that did they attach to him. The first experiences of his started when he lived with a friend, E that friend of his told him to be careful because he was having issues with duendes, but P scoffed at it, not really believing in it. But as the days went on, he started too. His keys would go missing, and he'd find them in places he'd never put them. He would hear a little pitter-patter of footsteps running in his room, even going as far as running under his bed and hitting it. His closet door opened up when it was fully closed as well. Soon after, he moved out and met his current girlfriend, Elle and unfortunately for him, her family had the same goblin problem. Elle's family's duende problem all started when her mother mocked a witch. Something you should never do, whether you believe it or not. Respect should always be there. So that witch cursed her and her family with duendes. They terrorized them for many years by knocking on walls, taking things, running around, and just being evil little things. But there's this one duende that bothers my brother to his core. He has even seen it, and his girlfriend's family actually caught a picture of it, but they deleted it out of fear it would hurt them. This dude was small, 
had sharp teeth, and always smiled. Believe it or not, he actually wears a top hat as well. When P told me all of this, I was skeptical, but who am I to say someone's experience isn't real? I have my own experiences that are unexplainable, so what makes others not real? He told me on one occasion that he was sleeping with L. In their room, and my brother is pretty tall, so his foot slightly hangs off the bed. P was trying to get to sleep when he felt a sharp thing that felt like a fingernail run down his foot. He got up, wide-eyed, and his heart was beating fast. P knew it was the goblin messing with him. A few days later, it was after he had dinner that he went out for a smoke. Else. Dog followed him out, and they sat on the porch step when the dog went crazy out of nowhere. She jumped up and ran at this tree, barking and growling for absolutely no reason. P was calling out to her, asking her what was wrong when he heard rustling the tree branches. So, he looked up, and there was that smiling duende, moving leaves aside and looking at him. My brother immediately grabbed his dog and went inside. Then there was a bang on the door when he closed it. He believes he locked it out because the rest of the night was calm. My brother has a little girl, and she started to get bothered by these things, so one day he had enough. He yelled and cursed at them, and that angered them. They bothered him even more, leaving his girlfriend and daughter alone. I had many experiences with what you guys call hellhounds. I forgot what their actual names were, but in my Hispanic culture, they talk about demon dogs. They appear in pairs, a type of yin and yang. A black dog and a white dog. So these dogs appear as an omen for people who are cursed or something like that. Well, my mom had a new man in her life, and since the start, we thought something was up with him. He was a cool person. It was great to kick it off, but he gave out a weird vibe, sort of creepy, like he just wanted him to leave. Anyway, he told us stories from Mexico, and in some of them, he believed he encountered a witch who cursed him. And random things happen around him, polite status, he has gotten used to it. While it freaked me and my brother the duck out, so, talking about the dogs, one day, my mom told us the story, starting that night. We kept hearing noises only at night on the roof of our apartment. If we were sleeping, it would wake us up. If we were falling asleep, it would keep us awake. We are here as if a big animal is walking above. We hear scratching and scampering. Of course, I automatically thought it was a cat or a raccoon. Days later, we started hearing a dog whining and growling right above us. Oh yeah, I forgot to say that only happens when the boyfriend is around. The day before they broke up, I awoke to the footsteps again, but this time it was different. It was walking on the wall beside me, and I slept on the second floor. So I put my ear in to listen better, and I could hear the dog breathing heavily. It started to growl, and I got scared and backed up. It let out a loud, eerie wolf howl and stopped. The next day, my mom and he broke up, and ever since, he left. Nothing else has happened. The Devil's Shelter is about a man from Tennessee, and it's great. As far as stories go, one comes to mind from my childhood in Tennessee. I was told it by an older neighbor of mine who had also grown up in the area. It supposedly happened when he was young. A poor older couple were farming near the river bottoms in Tennessee. One day, a group of young boys were out near their farm and decided to spook the old couple's mule. The mule jumped the fence and ran down to the river bottom, while the boys chased it. The old man searched all over for his mule and finally found it down by the river. He caught it and started leading it back to the farm. On the way up the river bank, he was bitten by a cottonmouth and didn't make it home again. After some time, the wife went out looking in the fields for her husband and eventually found him dead next to the river with their mule. She swore revenge on the boys who spooked their mule and were responsible for the death of her beloved husband. She walked through the fields, through the town, and all along the river, looking for those boys. She never found out who it was, and from that day forward, she hated all children. Years and years passed, those boys grew up, and the woman remained looking for a group of children who killed her husband. Sometimes people with kids would find doll heads on spike sticks near where their children liked to play. I didn't really believe this story, but a few weeks later, my neighbor called me over to show me there was a doll head on a broken stick over across his yard at the edge of the woods, which led down to the river. Years ago, I was in Boy Scouts, and every summer our troop went to a summer camp, Camp Yagog, in the rural woods of western Rhode Island. Now I am not sure if this story is legit, and I should probably research it now that I'm older and wiser but our scoutmasters told us a really good story about Lucy of the Woods. So, the story is that back in the 19th century, before the camp was a camp, a woman lived out in the woods on the same land that the camp now occupies. There is a long trail that leads off into the deeper part of the woods, going west from the main part of the camp. On an isolated part of the trail, 
where there's basically nothing but tall trees on either side as far as you can see, there's a large chunk of bedrock that straddles the trail. It is pretty flat and resembles an old house foundation. This was the footprint of Lucy's house. According to my tall tale telling scoutmasters, this rock is the place where Lucy's home was. Thus the name Lucy's Rock, it's officially called Lucy's Carpet. They told us, kids, that Lucy was a mother who experienced the premature death of her child due to diphtheria. Apparently, the doctor who filed the child's death certificate misdiagnosed the child, and Lucy felt that was the reason why she lost her child. So, feeling she was wronged, the legend says that Lucy's spirit haunts the wooded trails of Camp Yagog, seeking salvation. Every night, late into the night, she will return to the rock formation on the trail and sweep debris off of it. It is said that if you spell your name out on the rock face with pebbles or sticks and return the next day, anything that was on the rock has been cleanly swept away. I've witnessed this. So late one night, about eight of us, including one scoutmaster, hiked up to the rock where it is said that Lucy haunts regularly. Now, when you hike around in these woods, there is no ambient light from light pollution, even though it's a populated area of the country, it is pitch black. We got to the rock location, and we all turned off any flash lights we had and stood around the rock, being sure we respected any space that Lucy might cherish. I remember facing north, peering into the void of darkness, expecting to see something. It was a long time, and a lot of the kids in my group were joking and getting impatient. About 15 minutes went by before our scoutmaster decided that it was imprudent to hang around out on the trail and just head back to camp. Before I turned to head down the trail, a dull scream or screech was heard. It was like wailing. I turned to look back into the dark woods, and what I saw, to this day, gives me chills on the back of my neck, even as I write this. There was what started out as a dim, glowing ball of light. There was no sound other than the very low wailing. I don't even recall hearing my other troop members. It was as if time stood still. It was hard to assess its distance, but it was certainly off the train in the woods. Suddenly the dim light rapidly grew bright, like a spark, and jumped from my left to right about five or six feet. The light anomaly then slowly faded out and disappeared. And the wailing was gone, and the voices of my troop were active, and there were a lot of WTFs. To this day, other than this account, I cannot explain what I saw and heard in those woods. There are many other legends surrounding the life of Lucy, and she may not be related to this paranormal experience, but one thing I am sure of is that we saw something unexplained that night, and I am 100% sure that there is a spirit haunting Lucy's rock. I always say that I will never believe something's realness that I cannot see with my eyes. This experience is what makes me believe in the paranormal. I believe in paranormal stuff, mostly ghosts and stuff alike, but folklore like gnomes, fairies, etc. never sounds that real to me. Recently, a friend of mine told me about her experience, and I have had an experience of my own that was kind of spooky. The first one I heard was from an intern at my job, I don't know if it's the right translation, but it doesn't really matter. We worked in Mexico City at the time, but she was from a town in another state where her family still lived. Her aunt owns a house very close to some sort of forest where she lives alone and has a really big garden where she plants flowers and stuff. One day, the aunt just started telling her family that gnomes started showing up in her garden. So her family obviously never believed her until two of my friend's uncles, on different occasions, saw them running around and getting really spooked. They described them as really tiny people running around, they also said that they are really hard to spot, the first thing you notice is the movement. They were naturally very skeptical at first, thinking it must be mice or something, but the ant kept claiming they were gnomes, until one day one of them just saw this tiny man running in the garden. The thing is that her aunt lives alone, and she doesn't work anymore, so my friend's family visits her often to check on her and give her food and stuff. The weird thing is that the uncle who told the history after years of going to visit her sister just stopped going, claiming that the gnomes really freaked him out. My friend claims it isn't really like him to do that, so her family actually started thinking that the gnome story was true. She actually invited me to her town to visit her aunt, but it was a 7-8 to eight hour trip, and I never got the chance to do it. The second one really got to me because I kind of saw evidence of it. It happened around 2008, when we were visiting my father's family in Tabasco, in Mexico. They live on a ranch, and we were with them for four days. They own a pretty big space, and there are some parts of it where they don't work, so there are these big spaces of grasslands and some little swamps. There is a big house where my relatives live, and there are another two where the people who help them live. One is pretty near the main house, like 15 minutes walking down a dirt road, and the other is about 20 minutes driving. So this is relevant because the second day we were there, it was about 6 p.m., and they sent my nephew, who was about 10 to 12 years old, to the nearest house to get some ingredients for the dinner. So time goes by and my nephew doesn't come back, 
So they come to the conclusion that he stays in the other house playing with his friend, the son of the people who live there, until it gets really dark, like around 9 p.m. or something. They get worried and call the neighbor's house to ask for him, and they reply that he never shows up. So my dad, my uncle, and I went down the dirt road all the way to the other house and back, searching for my nephew, and saw or heard nothing. Finally, when we were back at the main house, there was my nephew crying because they had repented him really badly. So here comes the creepy part, my nephew was really dirty, had several scratches, and was even bleeding a little, just as if someone had dragged him into the bushes, there are plenty of bushes and tall grass at the sides of the dirt road. Almost all of my family said it was obvious he was playing in the open and he fell, but again, it was just as if someone had dragged him around. So finally, my nephew calmed down and told my sister and me the story. He was walking on the road when he started hearing some whistling. Apparently, he had heard the whistling before, so he got curious instead of freaking out and kept walking down the road. All of a sudden someone called his name, and between this tall grass he saw what he claims to be a gnome, he said it was smaller than him, so about four feet tall with plain clothes and a man face with wrinkles. At first, he thought it was his friend kneeling or something, but the voice was all weird. So apparently he was thinking all of this while this gnome told him over and over to come to play with him. He said he got scared, but he didn't run, so my guess is that he didn't feel danger. My nephew replied that he didn't want to play with him and that he had something to do, and the gnome replied that that's stupid and to just keep telling him to come with him and play. The next thing he remembers is lying on the ground, not that far from the road, so he got up and went running to his house in fear. Now I know this last story was really crazy, but he went missing for like 3 hours, and I saw all the scratches. He really gets dragged by something, and I really don't think he would just ditch everything to go play in the wilderness by himself. His parents make him work around the ranch, and they used to beat him when he ditched his chores, so it's not likely to happen. Second of all, he told this to my sister and me with no grown-ups around, so normally he would tell us the truth even if it was something bad. Also, he is younger than us, and he wouldn't make up something like that to scare us or anything. I wanted to share a couple of stories that have been passed down in my family. So first, I'll give some background information. These were told to me by my great-grandmother, currently 90, and my grandmother and her sister. These took place many, many years ago, when my great-grandmother was a teen and when my grandmother and her sister were very young. These stories take place in rural Mexico. My family lived on a ranch back when there were barely any cities, just a couple of houses. Meaning no electricity, communication, roads, or anything like that. Gnomes, so basically, in the ranch that my family lived in, they lived right next to this river, and other houses next to the ranch also lived near this river since it provided many resources. My grandmother told me that these gnomes came from up the river and closer inland, like many other creatures, which was completely uninhabited for hundreds and hundreds of years, which is why they believe these creatures were able to live there. These gnomes were about the size of a small child, and they were mischievous but not evil, in fact, it was known around the village that these gnomes loved children and would always play with them. Over the years, this became normal, and for some reason, people just accepted that they were living and seeing tiny people all of the time, different times, I guess. My great-grandmother told me that she played with them when she was a child, and when she grew up and had my grandmother and her sisters, the gnomes were still around. These gnomes would enter houses at night to play with children, and one time they entered at night and gave gifts to my grandmother that were in her crib because she was recently born. When my great-grandmother woke up and saw the crib, there were multiple stones from the river surrounding the crib, as well as some piles of dirt and other things from the river. People from all around the village would have different stories of these gnomes, sometimes they would get up on horses when someone was riding them, and even at night you could hear them in your roof and you could also hear them laughing. I don't remember my grandmother telling me if they had names or anything, they just referred to them as duendes, like gnomes, little people, or goblins. When I asked what happened to them and where they are now, they told me that after some years and after the world started changing, they just stopped appearing to them. The Tepas, I will first tell you the story that they told me, and then I will describe and talk about this thing. So basically, a relative of my grandmother who also lived near the ranch was walking next to the river at dawn because he was going to go fishing. As he was walking down the river, he saw a woman in the distance on the other side of the river. He described her as a beautiful woman with a perfect body and a white dress and long black hair, but he could only see the back of her. As he got closer, he thought that it was someone that he knew, so he started shouting to say hello and calling out her name, but she was not responding. As he got closer and closer, she finally turned around, and when she did, he saw that her face was actually a human skull. This guy screamed and was so scared that he fainted and was later found unconscious. He was taken to a hospital and was treated, but for many weeks he had a fever, and he was always scared. 
This thing had broken this man just by looking at him. And as the years passed, more and more people had experiences with these women, or as my family called them, tepas. Some other people that lived around the ranch sometimes saw them walking upstream and sometimes in pairs, so the people believed that they also lived more inland like the gnomes. These are some of the stories that I've been told, and if I'm being honest, I don't know if I believe them or not. I personally never experienced or met any of these creatures, but I find it odd that other cultures and people around the world describe them the exact same way, even though they did not have ways to communicate what they were seeing all around the world. Also, when my great-grandmother and grandmother told me these stories, I could tell from their eyes and the way they spoke that they were not lying, or at least that they fully believed that they had seen them and that these creatures were real. This story goes far back, but despite living here in this smaller city in Ontario, Canada, over the last 18 or so years, I first heard about it about 4 or 5 years ago. Just outside of town, there is a stretch of road between two main back roads. In between these two stop signs, there are about 2.5 kilometers, 1.55 miles for American friends, 7 houses, part of a golf course, and what appears to be a memorial plaque or grave. The plaque names a father and son and their death dates. The stories in this area date back to the 1940s, when, legend has it, indigenous girls were murdered in the area. A graveyard was formed for the victims, and it was fenced in wrought iron. The fence was then taken down during the Second World War, and it was replaced with a new one, which still stands. In the 1970s, a group of bikers partying in the cemetery threw the headstones onto the road in front of Ghost Hill, smashing them. The one plaque of the father and son is the only one that remains. My fascination with this area all started when my friend, who lived right at the top of the hill, told me all about it after work one night. He said he and his family had experienced events for years, especially his aunt, who lived right in the middle of the road that is Ghost Hill. According to him, during her seventh birthday party, she began screaming and crying uncontrollably and ran out of the house. She kept screaming and crying until she reached the plaque, where she fell unconscious. When she woke up, she had no recollection of the event, just her parents' word for it. Years later, my friend was driving down the stretch of road to head into town. It was a sunny day in July, and there was not a cloud in the sky, so he was driving his jeep without the soft top on. Out of nowhere, when passing the plaque, he got drenched with water. It was as if somebody took a 30-gallon bucket and managed to drop it specifically on him in the jeep. He stepped out of the jeep and looked around. The only thing that was wet was him, the jeep, and the radius around the jeep on the road. Everything else was dry, there was still a bright blue sky, and no one was around to have hosed him. He's brought up other experiences too, including seeing a woman dressed in white, bloodied, with her hair knotted down to her back and screaming at the top of her lungs right beside the plaque as well. The windows in the car were up, the radio was on, and the screams were still heard as he flew past. He said he'd stop the car to look in the rear view mirror, and she was gone, so all of these stories only built up my fascination. I looked online for more information and came across one site about local amateur ghost hunters trying to get more information. In a forum section, lots of locals identified the same few signs of paranormal experiences dating back to the 1960s, when this was a popular route to the nearby drive-in theater. When you begin your journey on Ghost Hill, people typically experience these things, a purple light to warn the driver of impending danger the ghost of a teenage boy waiting by the plaque asking for help, if you slow down, he will grab the door handle, a ghost car will chase you down the stretch of road, the face of an unknown apparition will peer into the window of your car and follow directly beside you, and finally, the plaque will light up with various colors on occasion. I first visited Ghost Hill with the same friend, who told me all about these incidents after we finished our shift one day. We started driving at about 11 p.m., four of us packed into his jeep, and to be quite honest, I was scared and excited because of all these stories. We drove past his house and his aunt's house and reached the plaque. We slowed down so he could show us where it was, because it's hard to spot in the dark. At this point, nothing had happened, so we kept driving and reached the end of the road, which is a T-intersection. As we did a U-turn to head back onto the road and drive down Ghost Hill again, we noticed a car coming from the other road. It appeared to be an old-styled Ford Mustang from either the 60s or 70s and had a white-on-white -white finish, again, it was dark. But this car never once slowed down and turned the corner on a dime, next thing we knew, it was right behind us and tailing hard. My friend decided to floor his jeep as we flew by the plaque once again, and this car was not giving up and kept flashing its high beams behind us as we were essentially racing down this road. We reached the second stop sign, which indicates the end of Ghost Hill, and the car behind us swerves to our left, doesn't slow down or stop for the stop sign, and once again turns left on a dime and disappears down the roadway. 
We all chalked it up to being a ghost car that the stories told us about, but we obviously have no way of confirming that. I had a very strange experience 12 years ago in Starved Rock State Park, Illinois. It was so bizarre at the time that I never discussed it. I began reading the missing 411 stories a few weeks ago and realized what I encountered fit into the missing 411 profile. Additionally, since many of the missing 411 stories border on the unexplainable and bizarre, I feel what I encountered was not unique, it was part of an actual phenomenon. Here is my story. I was visiting my girlfriend in Chicago. On a sunny and calm winter day, we decided to go for a hike at Starved Rock State Park, Illinois. I am an avid hiker, and being on leave from Iraq, I wanted to take in some cool, fresh air. We hiked the park for several hours. In the late afternoon, we started heading back to the car. About half mile away from the parking lot, we came into an area where tree branches were broken and pulled towards or over the trail. Most of the branches were broken high up, I'd say eight and more off the ground. I'd lived in WA before going to Iraq and knew something about Sasquatch areas. So I told the GF it looked like a squatch area due to the branches breaking off up high and pulling over the trail. That's about the time things started to get strange. Soon after mentioning this, I felt like someone was staring at me. It's like if you go into a room with a lot of people and someone is focused on you, you get an uneasy feeling and can tell you're being watched. It was like this, but stronger. I started to look around to see who was watching me. It was winter, and the forest was visible 100 feet in all directions. There was a group of walkers several hundred feet behind us and no one in front of us, but I saw no one staring at me. As we passed through Thesquatch area, I began to have the feeling someone was behind me, following us. I looked around and listened, but saw and heard nothing. There were just the people 400 or so back on the trail, and they were talking amongst themselves. They weren't looking our way. The sense of someone being behind me was persistent, so I kept looking behind me. I'd say at least twice a minute. But there was just the group way back. The feeling of being watched is one thing, but feeling like someone is close behind you is something else. It is more disturbing. I told the GF to go further in front of me and let her go about 20 in front because I had a strong sensation of a nearby presence just behind us. So I turn around for not more than 30 seconds since the last time I looked back, and there is this woman there. She was walking but coming up on me fast. There was something way off about her speed. She was walking when I spotted her, but her speed was much faster than her gait. It was as if she were on a people moving escalator, like in an airport. She was coming up fast and was, I'd say, no more than 15 or 20 feet behind me when I saw her. I was rather alarmed and glared at her. She stopped when our eyes met. I gave her a look like, WTF are you doing coming up on me like that? We stood there, staring at each other. Neither of us moved. She had her head cocked back to her left and looked at me from the corner of her eyes in a slightly alarmed you caught me type of look. She was completely normal looking, like a local Chicago lady in the late 1950s, wearing a bright red winter coat, gloves, slacks, etc. In hindsight, there are a few other things, besides her speed, that stand out. The first thing is that there was no sound, no footsteps, no rustling in the woods, nothing to tell me to turn around other than the strong sense of something behind me, which I'd had for a bit. At the speed she was moving, she would have had to have been running hard, but I heard no footsteps. She was not breathing hard, and her mouth was closed. Her gait was a walking gait. She was not running. However, she was moving towards me at a running speed. I mean fast. When she stopped, I'd say she was less than 20 from me. At the speed she was moving in one or two seconds, she'd have been on me. The next thing that stands out are her features. She had no distinguishing features. None in her hair, skin, or clothing. No shadowing, skin hues, dimples, etc. As a former army criminal investigator, I know to look for distinctive markings on people and clothing. There were none. I'd estimate her height at 5 feet 10 inches. Her clothes were of uniform color and indistinct. It was like she just stepped out of a department store. Her bright red coat was pristine, with a uniform hue to it. There wasn't even shading, which should have been given the clear sky and low sun. After staring at each other for, I'd say, 5 to 10 seconds, I felt like I got my point across, so I turned around and continued walking. The GF had not noticed anything and had continued walking. I took about three steps and realized there was no way she could have come up from that group in the 30 or so seconds since I'd last looked back. There was also nowhere to come from on either side. Visibility at that point was hundreds of feet all around. I said to myself, no way. And spun back around. She was gone. Simply vanished. I checked the group behind us, and no one had a red coat on or was looking at us. There was no one else around and there had been no sounds other than my foot falling. 
the woman just vanished. From that point, it took us about 10 minutes to reach the car. For the remainder of the walk, I did not feel like I was being stared at or followed. I have never been back to Starved Rock State Park and have no intention of going back. I've carried this experience around for 12 plus years and have been unable to talk about it because it was so exceptional and unexplainable. It's a relief to read similar stories of unusual encounters and disappearances. After reading many missing 411 accounts and the profiles of disappearances, I believe I narrowly averted being snatched by whatever that thing was. I do not think it was the woman I saw. I think it was something different that I could not see. I like to go hiking all the time, and most times I go by myself. I don't know if I can now after learning about missing 411, anyways, before this, I never thought much about it, and I was never scared about any paranormal stuff, I mostly got scared or worried about actual human creeps. Most of my family, friends, and I worried about someone hurting me since I am a female and petite. Luckily, nothing dangerous has happened to me. I've been reading and have noticed the connection between boulders, granite, rocks, and water. I have always been drawn to these, walking to touch the water and jumping from rock to rock. I've only experienced weird feelings two times, at Etiwanda Falls and Icehouse Canyon. During Etiwanda, I started hiking far away from the heavily trafficked area. Once I was far away, it started getting super quiet and dark, and I remember looking down the water stream and seeing I could still keep going. One part of me wanted to keep going, but something told me to turn around and leave. I remember becoming aware of my surroundings after spotting a camouflaged frog. I was jumping around when I almost stepped on one. At this point, I became aware of my surroundings and started looking around, and that's when I noticed that they were everywhere. So after this, I turned around and started walking fast towards getting close to other people. You know that feeling when you want to get away but can't go any quicker and your chest starts feeling heavier and heavier? I was so relieved and happy the moment I saw someone. I have been back there since then and have not experienced anything weird anymore. The other time happened when I was hiking an ice house canyon around the Mount Baldy area in California. This happened during my second time hiking this trail. The first time I hiked this trail was during the winter, and around that time, there were a lot of people, and I was able to follow, stay close, and stay safe. Also, the trail was more evident and just kind of made more sense around that time. The second time was closer to summer, and the path was so different, and it was practically empty, aside from people at the entrance. I had a hard time following the trail, and at one point, I was sure I was no longer on the right path. Maybe I was, I don't know. I remember being surrounded by rocks and trees, having a good time, but at the same time being a little worried. Then, the further away I got from the entrance and the more it became evident that there weren't people around, I started having a weird feeling. I should point out that these feelings never happen, even when I have been on more isolated trails. I tend to feel happy and at peace, and I'm usually singing. Anyway, I remember thinking that something didn't feel right and that I should turn around, which I did. I almost didn't, though, since my goal is always to make it to the peak or end. When I got to my car and got services, I had messages from my boyfriend. He was upset because he had been trying to get a hold of me and was starting to get worried. There was a big gap of time between when I started and when I got back to my car. I was gone for over 4 hours, when in reality, what I hiked should have only been an hour and a half tops too. I live in New York, Long Island. The Pine Barrens are pretty much my backyard, so there's a lot of deep and unexplored wilderness. Anyway, I was letting my dog outside and decided to take a look outside to make sure no animals were there and the coast was clear. I thought I heard music, but I thought my mind was playing tricks on me. I waited a couple minutes and then heard the sound I had heard before. It wasn't music, but it was a sort of animal sound. It sounded like a seal and a donkey combined. It made the noise a seal would make with the rhythm of a donkey. One thing that caught my attention was that it was moving. I heard it initially from what sounded like 30 feet away, and then it sounded a couple hundred feet away 15 seconds later. I think that either this thing was moving incredibly fast without making much noise, remember, this is the Pine Barrens, anything moving that fast would have made at least an audible noise that I could have heard from where I was standing, or there were two or more of these things. We don't have any wild dogs or anything around here. No coyotes or wolves live on Long Island, so I doubt some escaped from the zoo. So I'm wondering if it could be something paranormal, which is why I'm sharing it here. Does anyone know what it could be and if it fits in line with a legend or something? In the fall of 1980, I ran a small business as a construction contractor in Eugene, Oregon. During the slow times and in-between jobs, I would don my backpack and hiking boots and disappear into the mountains for weeks at a time, enjoying the peaceful solitude of long hikes. At that time, I was single and didn't answer to anyone, so I was free to do what I wanted when I wanted. On the trip in question, 
I decided to hike the old Malala Indian Trail that followed the ridge tops from Saddle Blanket Mountain to Oak Ridge, one of the Native Americans' favorite summer camps and trading centers. It was a beautiful August day, two days into the hike, I expected to be gone about two weeks, when, literally out of the blue, the most terrifying thing that ever happened to me in my life occurred. It would change my perspective on reality forever. I was walking along the trail, enjoying the strong breeze and bright sunshine, when, in the middle of a step, everything around me started to turn gray and blurry. The only way I can describe it is as if suddenly I was looking through someone else's prescription sunglasses. I finished one step and started another. Every inch I moved forward, the darkness increased, and the gray blurring turned into a jumble of shapes that made no sense. I then seemed to pass a barrier, and everything started to return to focus when my foot reached the ground. On the second step, everything around me had changed. Day had turned into night, and there was no wind. All the Douglas fir and pine trees had been replaced with thick jungle-like growth. The cool, thin mountain air was replaced with humid, thick air. There were no stars in the sky, but there was a diffused light that let me see everything clearly, however, I couldn't tell what the light source was. As often happens when the human body receives a massive dose of adrenaline, the entire incident appeared to be in slow motion, and even though I was only there for a second or two, I had time to observe my surroundings. The silence was broken by a continuous, high-pitched keening sound, and I was nearly overwhelmed with a sense of fear and danger. My momentum caused me to take one more step before stopping in my tracks. At this point, I heard a whispered gotcha over my right shoulder. I couldn't tell if I heard it with my ears or inside my head. The word wasn't directed at me, but something said the word quietly to itself. I was so terrified, I actually felt my heart stop for a moment. That whispered word is what saved me. I opened my mouth, gasped in a huge gush of thick air, and recoiled backward in the same footsteps I had entered wherever I was. As I threw myself backward, I looked over my right shoulder. A dark colored, hairy right hand and arm were reaching for my throat over my shoulder. The hand had pale ivory spade-shaped fingernails. The nails looked clean and almost had a manicured look to them. The thumb was placed lower, towards the wrist, on the hand than a human's is. Both hands and arms were thin and powerful looking, and both were covered with thick, coarse black hair. I got a good look at it because the thumbnail grazed my neck, it did not break the skin, as I moved backwards. As I continued backwards, the hand clutched where my neck had been a split second before, and it seemed to fade off into the distance as I returned through the portal. I took two more steps backwards, and everything reversed itself from what had just happened. The world around me became lighter, the fir and pines gradually came back into view, and by the third step, I was back on Saddle Blanket Mountain. I continued to move backwards in terror, and as I did, I observed that where I had just come from was a shimmering oval patch of air about the size of a large door. The woods behind it looked like they were underwater. By the fifth backward step, the shimmering area seemed to just evaporate, and everything was back to normal. By then, my lungs had nearly burst from the volume of air I had inhaled during the huge gasp I had just taken. My body felt like it was on fire from the adrenaline surge. I spun around and ran back down the trail as fast as my legs could carry me, and I didn't stop until I reached my truck. I spent nearly two days getting to that place and about three hours getting back. On my way home, I was absolutely horrified at the thought of what would happen if I were to drive my truck into something like that. It had been a trap, pure and simple. Whatever it was that tried to kill me somehow kept the portal hidden from me on the way in, and I didn't actually see it until I was back out again. I had terrible nightmares for years and still haven't come to grips with what happened. My fingers are trembling, and the hair is standing up on the nape of my neck as I write this. A ghost story from Kentucky is here. Decades ago, there was this mountain road on a place called Big Hill. It was the main thoroughfare to get from one county to another, and it wound down the mountain through dense tunnels of trees and down long, sloping curves. As the story goes, a woman was killed tragically, and when the culprit wanted to dispose of her body, he shoved her in an old dryer and pushed it over the edge, down into the woods of the hill. It wasn't unusual for people to dump their waste and unwanted items here, so it would have been just another piece of junk left behind. After that, People started making reports of seeing a woman walking up and down the hill at night, all alone on the dark tree-lined road. People started to say that you should never leave the window cracked when you're traveling Big Hill because drivers have seen her on the side of the road and then suddenly her face in their rear-view mirror. She would hitch a ride from the top to the bottom, and then she would be gone. They always said she was looking for the man who dumped her body, and if you didn't want her hitching a ride, always have your windows up so she couldn't get in. Some years later, due to the traffic use of that road, they actually redid it entirely. I blasted and removed trees, and I actually ended up rerouting it entirely to make it better for semis. 
you can see the remnants of the old road off in the woods, and the few remnants where the old road looks like it crosses over where they built the new road. After they built the new road, there weren't any more reports of the woman on the hill. The superstition went away, and the talk of her died down. I think about that from time to time, and I imagine she's still there, walking the old forest road where time has forgotten it. I was just waiting to find the one who killed her. In southern Tennessee, close to Chattanooga, there is a road called Shipley Hollow Road. Going into my story, I did not know about the legend of Pity Pad or the history of Shipley Hollow. I was dating someone who lived close by at the time, and we had decided we wanted to go ghost hunting one night. He brought this up because there is a graveyard, and it was in the middle of nowhere. One night, my boyfriend at the time, myself, and his cousin Jacob decided we wanted to go ghost hunting. I lived in Murfreesboro, about two hours north, so they suggested we go to Shipley Hollow. As soon as we had discussed this, my dog started acting strange. Growling at the doorway when no one was there, pacing, and whining. I, of course, already had an uneasy feeling about this place. We got in my car and started the 30-minute drive to the graveyard. The whole drive there, I felt very uncomfortable. It seemed like someone was watching us. There was almost a sense of dread. We turned on an old road and began our drive up Shipley Hollow Road. About halfway up the road is a bridge that goes over a stream. I stopped the car so we could get out and look at the water, and Jacob said he wanted to get in. The bridge was probably 10 to 15 feet from the stream, so it would have been a bit of a hike down. I automatically said no and asked him to get back in the car. He didn't respond, and my boyfriend had to literally drag him back to the car. It was like he was hypnotized or something. So we get to the graveyard, and I park the car. From what I remember, since it was at least 10 years ago, there was a gravel road through the graveyard. So when we got out, there were graves on both sides of us. I turned the car off, flicked off the lights, and the three of us got out of the car. We were talking and looking at the graves using a flashlight when, all of a sudden, we heard a blood-curdling scream. It was one of those moments where you feel as though you imagine it because of how cliché it would be. Jacob continued to talk, and I heard it again. It was faint, like it was far off in the woods. I yelled at him to stop talking, and that's when we heard it for the third time. But this time, it sounded much closer. The screams were terrifying. It sounded like a woman screaming bloody murder, and the screams lasted maybe three to four seconds. All three of us ran back to the car, flipped the lights on, and sped to get out of there. After that, weird things started happening. I'd wake up feeling like someone was staring at me from a corner in my boyfriend's bedroom. We'd hear voices when we were the only ones at his house. Cabinets and doors would open by themselves. A shampoo bottle flew across the bathroom when I was showering one morning. This was a new house in a new neighborhood as well. It got so bad that his parents hired paranormal investigators to come in and check out their house. We broke up shortly after, and they ended up moving houses. I haven't noticed anything since leaving the house, but I was wondering if anyone else had ever visited Shipley Hollow or had something follow them home from somewhere. I grew up in the rural woods of the Midwest. My grandparents had a cabin on 160 acres in the Ozarks, and my family home was in the woods of Ohio. I now live out west in a large city with my husband and kids, but his family has a cabin in northern Idaho, where we spend a lot of time in the summer. That's where this all took place. So when I say I know the woods, I really do. This happened a few years ago, in the middle of the summer. We had arrived at the cabin only to realize my husband had somehow totally spaced out and forgot to pack my hiking boots. I was livid because all I had on were cheap flip-flops, and I had been so looking forward to hiking that weekend. It kind of put a sour mood on the evening, and we settled in. The cabin isn't much, though in the woods it is part of a community or cluster of other cabins. The one perk of ours is that it is right against a large field surrounded by woods. It's private property, and there are some weird stories and histories about the family that owns it, but that field is mostly abandoned. We have a four-foot barbed wire fence that runs the length of the field to separate our land from that. It's not too far from the cabin, I'd say maybe 20 feet from our porch to the fence line. That night after dinner, I made up the air mattress for the kids and folded out the sofa bed for us. Soon everyone else was asleep, but since I have horrible insomnia, I was still up around 2 a.m., reading my book and sipping wine, when I heard the most awful noise. I slipped my flip-flops on and poked my head out the front door. There was a sound coming from the field. I stepped out onto the porch to listen more intently. It's the sound of a coyote being hurt. At first, I thought maybe it was stuck in a trap, and I got so angry. My husband's family is known for our dogs, and the idea that someone was trapping them near us made me so angry. I cannot tell you how or why, but every cell in my body was screaming for me to help it. I ran inside to get a flashlight, it was a new moon, 
so there was zero light outside, and once again found myself upset that I didn't have my boots. There was no way I was going to make it even to the fence line in my flip-flops. Between the woods and terrain, it was happening near the corner of our property that can be best called a trash heap, an abandoned camper, a wood pile, metal drums for burning, etc. I had no idea what I could even do to help, but I just so badly felt like I had to do something. So I went back outside, and all I could do was listen. The more I listened, the more I realized it was being attacked by something. And that's when the hair on my neck stood up. I realized everything was dead quiet. I have never before or since heard the woods like that. Whatever was attacking the coyote was also doing it silently, no snarl, no bark, no yip, no growl. And as I stood there frozen and listening, I heard the final noises as the coyote died. I had tears in my eyes because it was such an awful sound. As soon as it died, I was hit with the force of the sounds around me. Suddenly the neighbor's dogs were howling and barking, the bugs and crickets started up, it was like a switch had been flipped. It went from no sound to all the sounds in the blink of an eye. That's when I heard the food steps. Whatever had attacked the coyote was suddenly on our side of the fence. It was walking along the fence line, and it was clearly bipedal. I cannot stress this enough. I grew up in the woods, humans and animals sound different, and this sounded human. It was clearly walking on two legs. I kept staring along the line, trying to see whatever it was, but as the footsteps grew closer to the middle of the property and still I couldn't see anything, I panicked and ran quickly back into the cabin. I locked the door, grabbed a hatchet, and woke my husband up. I couldn't believe he was able to sleep through everything. He hadn't heard a thing. The next morning, we went directly to where I told him the sound was coming from, the attack, but he couldn't see anything. Though the field at that time of year is like four feet tall, we didn't expect to see anything, and I was not about to hop the fence to go looking for trouble. I will say I had never been so thankful to not have had boots that weekend, because without a doubt I would have tried to hop that fence that night, I just know I would have. Something in me was screaming to make it stop. Anyway, I'm sure this is rambling a bit, but I felt so alone on this for years. My husband believes me, but I mean, we have no logical answer. Hoya Bachu Forest 1. Background. There are places on earth that are magnets for all sorts of strangeness and bizarre events that seem to elude our understanding of the world, but the one that fascinates me the most is Hoya Bachu, located in Romania near the city of Cluj. The forest is known for having all sorts of bizarre events, ranging from UFOs and mysterious orbs to disembodied voices and physical effects like nausea and hearing disembodied voices. 2. The Circle Much of the phenomenon seems to center around a mysterious, near-perfect circle in the center of the forest where no vegetation grows. Science has yet to explain the mysterious circle. Soil samples and tests for radiation have been run all around the circle, all returning normal in comparison to the rest of the forest. Trees outside the circle grow in bizarre, twisted ways, which visiting scientists have also yet to explain. 3. The Phenomena Almost every type of paranormal phenomenon has been reported within the forest. Physical effects such as nausea, fatigue, feelings of dread, and anxiety are commonly reported by visitors to the forest. At night, ghostly orbs aren't uncommon sights to see. Some visitors report that these orbs show some signs of intelligence, knowing when they are being watched or pursued. Visitors and locals alike report mysterious, disembodied voices ranging from murmurs to loud shrieks. Apparitions are also reported throughout the forest. Physical attacks such as shoving, scratching, and pulling are also reported. In an episode of Sci-Fi's Destination Truth, a cameraman named Evan was doing an EVP isolation session in the mysterious circle mentioned earlier. He captured a disembodied voice, and shortly thereafter he was forcefully shoved to the ground with three scratches appearing on his forearm, which were described as itching and burning. The forest isn't just home to strange activity on the ground. The forest first rose to international notoriety for being a hotbed of UFO activity. Ring the 60s and 70s. In 1968, a photographer captured an alleged flying disc above the forest, and since then, the forest has been of interest to scientists and nations. However, this isn't where Hoya Bachu's legend even begins. 4. Legends. Though there is little evidence to prove it as opposed to other phenomena occurring in the forest, there are many stories of people vanishing. The original legend is of a sheep herder with 200 sheep disappearing into the forest, only to never return. Another legend involves a young, five-year-old girl disappearing only to return years later. 5. Conclusion The Hoya Forest holds many mysteries that hold the interests of ufologists, scientists, and paranormal enthusiasts alike. It is not likely that we will understand the anomaly that is the Hoya Forest, 
but perhaps if we continue to study and document the strange events occurring in the forest, we will catch a glimpse into parts of our reality that are rarely seen. I live in Connecticut, and for my birthday this past Sunday, a friend and I checked out some abandoned places across the state. We love going exploring. One place I was really excited to visit was Little People Village. It is this little village in the middle of the woods, with foundations left behind, including foundations of tiny, detailed houses. There are a few urban legends surrounding this place. One of them being that it was built as an extension to Kwasi Amusement Park to travel to via trolley, actually, I couldn't make much sense of this explanation. There was nothing behind suggesting a trolley line led to it, and we had to hike with a little difficulty to get to see everything. The other legend is that of a husband and wife who lived either in or near the woods. The wife began to see and hear fairies, so she insisted that her husband build a village for the little people, so he built all of these little houses for them. She apparently believed she was the queen of the fairies, so she had a throne built as well. There is a legend surrounding the throne that if you sit on it, you will die within seven years. It is said that the couple went crazy and ended themselves. It was definitely a strange place to visit. I'm not sure if I completely believe the legend or not, I don't really believe the part about the cursed throne. But I feel that something was in those woods. I felt very uneasy the whole time we were in the woods. It felt like something was wrong there and that something terrible had happened there. The feeling intensified when we got near the throne. At one point, my friend heard me laughing. There was a group of teenagers that came in behind us, but it couldn't have been them. I was standing right next to her, and I didn't hear it. I saw movement from the corner of my eye as we were leaving, but it may have just been a leaf. The wind was blowing a bit, but when I turned back, I didn't see the leaves being blown. After we walked out of the woods and got about halfway back to the car, my friend stopped and asked me if I felt like I was being watched or if someone was following us. I didn't feel this. Then she mentioned feeling uneasy and described the exact feeling that I had while we were in the woods. The closer to the car we got and the further from the woods, the more the feeling went away. I definitely want to go back there to try to capture some EVPs or video. I, however, wouldn't go at night. There used to be more little houses left behind, but people are idiots and feel the need to destroy things and ruin them for others. There were a few little houses left, the throne, some strange foundation pieces, and the foundation or shell of a larger house. I actually walked into the house too. My friend noted that a lot of the stones used were not local to the area and had to have been imported somehow. I contacted a few local paranormal groups to see if they had any more information or thoughts on this place. I heard back from a local paranormal researcher. As far as he knows, none of the local investigation groups have investigated this site. Anyway, the investigator said that he wasn't aware of anything terrible happening in that specific spot. However, he believes that Native American spirits were most likely what we sensed. He said that there were lots of Native Americans in the area, especially in the 1800s, and they could still be there protecting the land. I would not be surprised at all. There is a good deal of graffiti left behind, as well as some litter like beer bottles and cigarettes. They could be angry at the disrespect that people are showing their land. My family has a history with what we call brownies, but what I think is some kind of house spirit. They tend to take things and then return them to strange places. I always thought it was us misplacing things or just object blindness, but I've had a few events change my mind. Once in college, my roommate couldn't find her school ID. She needed it to ride the bus, so I helped her look. We tore apart the apartment, emptied drawers, and even dumped out her purse. We pulled everything out of her wallet too, but the ID was nowhere to be found. We started to talk about finding another way to school and decided to walk, so she went to get her purse, and there, sitting across the zippered top of her bag, was her ID. We always had a brownie at home, but it seemed that once we moved out, each of my sisters and myself got one as well. When I moved across the country, I spent a few weeks in my new rental with nothing but some dishes, my laptop, and an inflatable mattress. With the house being so empty, it seemed there were none of the usual places for my brownie to hide. I actually saw her darting from room to room, a gray blur about the size of a cat. It really freaked me out, so I asked her not to show herself again in exchange for a shot of whiskey, which I poured and left on the window sill. She didn't show up or cause any mischief again until the furniture arrived. I had a very accurate reading by a psychic once who channeled some dead loved ones, etc., and she even mentioned I had a being attached to me, which she called a gremlin. I don't know what my brownie is, a sprite, a fairy, or a house spirit. I know she acts up the more the house feels chaotic, fighting or disorganization especially triggers her. I also know that in insane places things reappear, which usually defies logic, and that everyone who cohabitates with me ends up having at least one experience with my brownie.
I also know that leaving a shot of hard liquor out just for her will usually get you your stuff back. The Bell which was a local haint in my hometown that is a story in its own right, but I have an old tale related to her. Growing up, I would walk to and from school, and I would cut through my neighbor's property to get there. Miss Ebby was her name. Sweet as pie with a voice smooth as butter. She was a widow and an empty nester, and I think all around she was a little lonely. Anyway, she and I got into this routine where I'd stop by her house every afternoon on my way home from school, and she'd usually feed me cornbread, biscuits, or some sort of snack, and we would just hang out and chat on her big front porch. Well, one day I noticed the doors were all flung open, and something just didn't seem right. I walked into the house, and her house was torn to pieces. I mean, all the cabinets were open. Everything pulled out and strewn all over the place. I honestly thought she'd been robbed. So I start yelling for her, and I hear her hollering upstairs. Now keep in mind that she lived in an old antebellum mansion. This place was huge, and though I was there every day, I never made it past the kitchen. So I hear her yelling for me upstairs, and I run up this huge grand staircase and through this winding hallway, where I find her in her bedroom. She is distraught. She's hooting, hollering, and wailing, I can't find it. I can't find the book. I asked her, what book? And she said, the spell book. I knew exactly what she meant at that point. Somewhere down her family lineage was a relation to the Bell Witch, and somehow she had come into possession of one of her spell books. This was common knowledge among her close friends and loved ones. I remember looking at it once. She kept it locked up in a cupboard downstairs, like it was a museum piece. She went on to tell me she had opened up the book that day just because she was curious or something. She ran out to the grocery store, and she came back. Her house was in ruins, but the only thing missing was that damn spell book. Never to be found again. Until her dying day, she swore she was cursed because of losing that book. When I was 16, my dad told me about a backwoods road called Middle Bridge. The legend was that a teenage couple was running late for curfew. As they entered the woods, their car was racing along the road. As the road drops down deep into the woods, it heads directly perpendicular to the river until it makes a 90 degree right turn to run beside it. A couple hundred yards later, it again makes another 90 degree turn, only this time left to cross the bridge. Since the couple was driving too fast, the boy ran their car off the bridge and into the river, killing both of them. My father said when he was our age, they would drive down to the bridge at night and turn off their cars. Out of the woods, they would see shadows, and their car would begin to shake. This is the legend that initially brought us to this area. We were at my grandparents one night, and I was asking my dad for directions to get to Middle Bridge. My aunt chimed in with a story of her own. At the beginning of the woods, there was an old farmhouse. She had some friends who bought the house but moved out soon after. Pictures would fall off the walls, chairs would slide across the old hardwood, and doors would open and close. It was enough to spook her friends out of there after only a few months of occupancy. As far as she knew, everyone that moved in would move out shortly after. I took these stories to my friends with directions to get there. We piled into the cars late one Friday night, and a group of about eight of us, two car loads, headed to Middle Bridge. Now we follow my dad's directions, but a lot has changed over the years. As we entered Middle Bridge, we were rather disappointed, to say the least. In a one-quarter mile stretch, we passed a new office building, some new subdivisions, as well as construction areas for new ones going in, and all this was about half a mile from a main road in town. Not exactly what we pictured. We reached a point where a gate blocked our way, and we had to walk on foot. About 25 yards down the gated road, it became gravel and sloped. Another 50 yards led us to an old cemetery. Cool, but the new houses next to it didn't add much to the ambience of creepiness. As we continued down the gravel road, another 100 yards or so, we saw it. The bridge. Then we realized why there was a gate. The bridge had washed out. We could tell it was old as it looked to be mostly stone, old green moss covered the gray blocks of stone. The complete center was missing, though, no doubt it had fallen into the river below during high waters. Then it hit us, we're on the wrong side of this bridge. Now, this was in 2005, and though that doesn't seem too long ago, it was before everyone had phones and could immediately search directions to get where they needed to go. Luckily, I had a GPS in my glove box, and after trial and error, we found out where we needed to go to get to the other side. Remember how I said that this side of Middle Bridge was less than a mile off the main road? Well, the other side was quite a way out. We circumvented out into the county about 10 miles and backtracked around. We went from being in the city suburbs on one side of the bridge to farmland and backwoods on the other. On this side, the road was so overgrown that no gate was needed. 
Down trees were covered in so much vegetation that it was impossible to even walk on the road. We had to walk in the cornfield alongside the woods until we reached the river and then fight our way back into the trees. It was eerie reaching the bottom of the woods by the river. The vegetation thinned out, and the trees went from thick old trunks to young, thin saplings. The moon was bright out, and as far as you could see into the woods, there were just slim trees with some undergrowth. The fog hovered a couple feet off the ground. I could see why my dad said he would see shadows move through the woods. The visuals could easily play tricks on your mind. We reached the bridge and hung around for a few minutes. We waited in silence to see what would happen, but nothing happened. Other than the creepy background, it seemed like the ghosts were more afraid of us that night. We began our hike out of the woods and back up the hill. Just as my aunt described, the house resided off the road, right before the woods. We decided to not let the trip go to waste and to check out the house. No cars were outside and the lights were off, so we assumed it would be okay just to walk around it for a bit, looking back, we were asshole kids for this, it was a house in the middle of nowhere, and I could only imagine how scared I would be if someone was poking around my house at night. I need to mention that I brought my digital camera with me, my Motorola Silver didn't have a camera on it. I had been snapping pictures of the woods and bridge while down there with fresh batteries in hopes of catching something paranormal. Other than the occasional orbs, just kidding, water droplets, I've had no luck so far. As soon as I snapped the first picture of the house, my camera died on me. Mind you, these were fresh batteries that hadn't gone through 30 pictures so far. It was strange, but ultimately, I didn't think much of it at the time. As we were snooping around outside, it became clear that no one was living here after all. The outside was overgrown, the screen doors were torn, and the electrical wires from the pole were torn. It was clear that no one had been here for a while. I hear one of my friends shout, Hey, it's open. We ran around back as he eased open the back door. Now I wish I could remember more about our time in the house. What I do remember is this, there was no light anywhere on the property other than our flashlights. We flicked switches on everything, but the house had power abandoned long ago, it seemed. As we shined our lights into the house, it looked like someone one day just said duck it, packed a bag, walked out, and never came back. There were dishes in the sink. There was old food in the cupboard. All the furniture was still there, and the TV still sat in the living room. On the bed was an open suitcase with clothes in it. Just imagine walking out of your front door right this instant and coming back later to everything covered in dust. That's how this place was. We poked around for a bit, stood in silence, and did the whole ask questions thing. It was completely eerie and unsettling to be there. We didn't last long in there before we all decided to leave. We exited the back door from the darkness of the house to the moonlit yard. We headed back to our cars and stopped for a cigarette between our cars and the house. We stood in the darkness, only accompanied by the glow of our burning embers. Just then, a light switched on. The very back porch we just exited now had a faint light slowly shining brighter on the upper ceiling. I ran pretty quickly that night. We got into our cars and booked it off of Middle Bridge. Even now, I'm not sure how that light came on. Old farmhouses like that were cut down long ago. Other than a generator, I'm not sure, and even then, we would have heard it. We also checked every corner of the house and didn't find anyone there, so I can't really wrap my head around how. We returned a couple more times. I brought a disposable camera the second time, and every picture on the roll came out black. The third time, I brought extra batteries with me for my digital camera, but the batteries either died or the pictures came out black with the flash on. If you go there now, the house is gone. I guess someone decided it was time to demolish it and move on. The road to the bridge is completely swallowed up as well. Without knowing about it, you would just assume the road ends in a peculiar way. Though under the vegetation, down the hill, and along the river, you can still find the old stones covered in moss on Middle Bridge Road. On the evening of September 4, 1964, 28-year-old Donald Shrum, along with two friends, Vincent Alvarez and Tim Trueblood, were hunting in the Tahoe National Forest near Cisco Grove, California. All had considerable experience bow hunting. And all were overall general outdoorsmen. On this particular night, after having established a camp, they were hunting for deer. Perhaps due to their comfort in the outdoor environment, with the night fast approaching no less, all agreed they would push deep into the woods in pursuit of their targets and, if they had to, they would spend the night in the woods and rendezvous back at the camp in the morning. Before long, all were separated and venturing after their potential kills. With daylight losing the battle against the night, Shrum would make the decision to find somewhere to bed down for the night. Or, more accurately, bed up. Shrum had with him a military-style belt, which allowed him to secure himself in a tree. Given the number of wild animals who might wish to turn the tables on the hunter, 
Shrum believed this was a preferable option to camping on the ground alone and, ultimately, defenseless. Shortly after securing himself for the night, however, a strange light appeared in the distance. Of more concern to Shrum, it was zigzagging around the trees at low altitude and heading towards him. Thinking his two friends had arranged a search for him after all, he jumped from the tree and quickly released three of his flares to give away his destination. As he was waving his arms and yelling for attention, he began to realize what was heading his way wasn't a rescue helicopter at all. The glowing object finally stopped around 50 yards from his position. It was spherical, but unlike anything he had ever seen before. He quickly made his way back up the tree, making sure his bow was at the ready. Fear was now rising at a seemingly unstoppable rate within him. That fear would rise even more when three small humanoid creatures emerged from the craft and began making their way straight towards him. As they came closer, he could see that while two of them were most definitely humanoid, the third was more robot-like. The two humanoids began to shake the tree, obviously in an effort to force him from it. He would cling on with all of his strength. However, when a white vapor shot out from the robotic creature's mouth, he later realized he was knocked unconscious. Only momentarily, however. Aside from an intense feeling of nausea, he was unharmed. He began lighting the matches he used for his flares, dropping them towards the menacing trio in an effort to force them away. Although they would back away for a short while, they soon continued their assault. By this time, Shrum had managed to load an arrow into his bow and let it fly in the robot's direction. Seconds later, a shower of sparks flew into the air, suggesting a direct hit. As quickly as he could, he fired two more arrows in the general vicinity of the creature's location, causing them to back away. However, before he could take advantage of the situation, a second robot appeared. And once again, a white vapor hit Shrum and caused him to lose consciousness. As before, he must have been out only for a short time, as the creatures were still below and it was still very dark. However, the two humans were now attempting to climb the tree. He began to light anything he could and then drop it down so as to deter them, including pieces of his clothing and his baseball cap. When he could no longer use clothing, he would send branches, pines, and anything else he could get his hands on. While this nocturnal standoff played out, the strange aerial vehicle suddenly shot upwards and out of sight. The strange creatures below, however, continued, undeterred by these events. And while Shrum could hold them off temporarily, they would ultimately return. Then, at some point during the night hours, another robot appeared from somewhere in the surrounding woodland. It appeared to link up in some way with the other robot. The next thing Shrum knew, a thick, black cloud of smoke was heading in his direction. In the seconds that followed, he blacked out once again. When he awoke this final time, he was alone. There was no sign of the ship having returned, but all of the creatures, including the robots, were gone. He was barely hanging from the tree by his military-style belt. He could also see that, by now, Dawn was quickly heading his way. By the time daylight was the stronger influence, he had dropped himself from the tree. Dazed, tired, but largely unhurt, he would set out for the pre-arranged meeting place of the campsite from the previous afternoon. Once there, he would discover both of his friends waiting for him as planned. Furthermore, one of his two fellow hunters, Vincent Alvarez, could, at least in part, corroborate the incident. From his position, he witnessed the strange, glowing craft moving over the trees. It would then take off with great pace into the sky. This would likely have been while Shrum was battling with the strange creatures. Incidentally, all three of the men would return to the destination later that day after hearing Shrum's story. They did find several of the arrows he had fired, as well as several pieces of charred clothing. However, the coins he had thrown at them had seemingly been scooped up by these menacing visitors before they left. His two friends would believe his claims, though. In part due to Alvarez's own sighting of the glowing craft leaving the scene. However, when Shrum's mother-in-law, upon hearing of the encounter, told an astronomer friend from the local college, things began to take a gritty turn. The astronomer would immediately contact the nearby McKelland Air Force Base. He would inform them of the account and the location of the witness. Even more bizarre, instead of visiting him at his home to listen to his version of events, even though he had not made a report, they would arrange to meet in an empty house at an off-base housing development. Shrum would agree to the meeting. The two officers present would listen to his account and then confiscate several of the arrows. Later claims suggested these had shavings of the robot on them. Then, though, they would insist that what he had just described to them hadn't happened. Or not in the way he remembered. Furthermore, they would present several alternative scenarios, as if giving him the opportunity to pick one for himself. He would eventually agree that he wasn't certain of what he had seen. If for no other reason than to keep his employers from facing similar questions. 
Shrum has stuck to the same story and version of events for over half a century. And surely a hoaxer would have made sure at least one of the other hunters witnessed the events in full. Authenticity, if nothing else. Perhaps the fact they didn't is proof enough of such authenticity. Paranormal Hot Spot, Spirit Lake, Idaho. Spirit Lake is a small town north of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, with many haunted houses and much talk of ghosts. Before I get into the deep digs of the paranormal activity in the area, I would like to put a little background content on the town. I fully want to disclose that all this information I am providing is word of mouth, except for how the lake was named. Before it was even settled, the Kootenai tribe resided in the area. The tribes in this area were constantly at war with each other. To make peace, the chief promised his princess daughter to marry the prince son of the enemy tribe. But the princess was already madly in love with a warrior. Completely distraught, the couple went to the lake and jumped in. Drowning. And haunting the lake forever. Legend has it that you will see the two in a canoe with mist around it. The tribe names the lake something that translates into English as Spirit Lake. On top of this eerie tale, there are many deaths and memorials around the lake. It's exceptionally weird because I've been to many lakes in North Idaho as an avid fisher, and none have nearly as many memorials or graves as this. I only confidently know three stories of deaths in the lake. One was a seven-year-old boy swimming in shallow water who got tangled in weeds and drowned. I always wondered why weeds that could easily be pulled up drowned him. The lake bottom is very muddy, and stuff like that doesn't root well in there. Maybe he just panicked and couldn't pull up. Or maybe something held him down there. Another was at your classic backwoods, trespassing, high school, bonfire, or party. The junior was drunk, and no one noticed him falling into the water. How did he not make a sound? The sound echoed a lot in the area he was in. There wasn't any loud music because they didn't want to get caught. Did someone jokingly push him in and think he was well enough to get out on his own? Did he slowly fall in, and no one noticed? Or did something pull him in? The final story I know is about a drug deal gone wrong. Two teenagers were fighting over pot money. It was winter, and the other got violent and pushed him in. The water is very shallow and iced over. But he got trapped under the ice. Most of the memorials are male teens. The negative energy is added by the negative witches that lived in Spirit Lake. They were known for sacrifices and rituals. Many of them in the 1960s would stop people on the highway at night and try to convert them. They are still there to this day. I lived two houses down and would wake up to chance and no correlation to the moon cycles. The family women were not allowed to get out. The father and uncle were pervasive. They dressed in old-fashioned farmer clothes in brown, gray, and black. The women would wear bonnets. To this day, many animals go missing on Halloween. I know they do so everywhere but much more was noticed in Spirit Lake than in any of the other bigger neighboring towns. Spirit Lake started out as a logging town and died shortly after. There are many old buildings left, and it's advertised as a beautifully historic downtown Spirit Lake with Inland Empire trails on the local radio stations. It also has many haunted buildings. The old movie theater that is now a florist shop, the White Horse Saloon, a rundown building next to the elementary school, a greenhouse next to the park, and one commercial building that is, recently no longer standing, behind the hardware store. Many locals claim they have both negative and positive spirits haunting their houses as well. And Spirit Lake is full of good, honest church people. It is widely accepted that ghosts are everywhere. And we pray devotedly for the protection of us and our neighbors. There are two mountains nearby that also have paranormal or alien activity. Rathdrum Mountain and Hoodoo Mountain lights, ghosts, and Bigfoot reports frequently come in from there. Both negative and positive experiences. I have been hunting many times in the Hoodoo area and on Inland Empire paper land as well. I haven't really had any paranormal experiences, but I have seen how a Bigfoot could be hiding. There is so much wilderness and pocketed areas that would provide a lot of coverage and hiding spots. I haven't had any really paranormal interactions with the area, I think. There was one day I was completely distraught and walked through the woods, and the woods felt comforting and more reassuring than usual, but I'm 90% sure that was just because I love the wilderness. I do know people in groups who have seen stuff that I completely agree with. They are honest, old-fashioned, and churchgoers. I do recognize that Spirit Lake has above-average drug usage and may cause some of the paranormal interactions. But I do feel a negative energy in certain areas from the sorrow and dark behaviors that the land has, and I think the druggies feed the paranormal energy. Something is just inexplicably complicated and unknown. While Spirit Lake haunts many, it also blesses many with beautiful land, plentiful hunting and fishing, and a tight-knit community that looks out for each other. I saw an Aswang. It is a mythological creature based in the Philippines. This is my story. It happened in December. 
I forgot my age because this happened a very long time ago. And I was still young when this happened. I woke up because of the light. My aunt was getting ready to go to church. It was already 3 a.m. because of night mass. I pretended to fall asleep because if she knew I was awake, she would take me to church with her. My aunt left and turned off the light, but I was very scared at that time. I don't know why, but I can't shake the uneasiness feeling, so I turn on the light. My brother and I were sleeping on the opposite side of the window. The curtain was open, but there was a screen so that mosquitoes could not get inside the room, and I put the blanket over my head because I was scared. Five minutes later. I felt very hot, and I was sweating all over, so I removed the blanket from my head, and my eyes suddenly looked by the window, you know, when a person is staring at you, your brain can detect that he or she is staring, so you look back at the person. Anyway, what I saw on the window made my jaw drop. I saw a human frog dangling outside our window. The eyes are bloodshot, and the face is covered with hair. I cannot tell who because of the hairs all over the face. When she knew I saw her, she immediately flew, like the wings covered the entire window, and she flapped the wings very heavily. There is no way in hell that was an ordinary bird because it flapped very heavily as if it were a person. Also, it is impossible that it is a prank because we are on the second floor, and our second floor is very high, like the steel ladder cannot even reach it. That's how high it is. Also, there are no railings outside the window that a person can hold on to. So it is impossible, just impossible. There are no posts near our window, and there are no trees for a person to climb and peek through the window. If I never saw that thing or whoever it was, I would never, ever, ever believe that they existed. As they say, to see is to believe. I always ask myself, even to this day, are they the fallen angels? What are they? I have so many questions, but no answers to them. Only they can probably answer, or probably most of them do not know their origin because I heard it has been passed from generation to generation. It is similar to being a spiritual healer. Or a legit psychic. If the psychic or spiritual healer dies, they can pass on their power to one of their relatives. Near where I live, there is a large white house called, by some, a mansion. It sits alone on top of a ridge, surrounded by a sea of trees. The grass line of the lawn slopes down at a crazy angle, and the grass trails off like tendrils into several dark openings into the woods. If you know where to go, you can watch the house in the moonlight. With all the lights off, it looks like a group of teeth jutting out of the ground. This house was in place before much of the surrounding area was built up, so for its time, it was the home of a wealthy family. The usual stories are assigned to the home, madness, violence, debauchery, etc. The wealthy often seem to be driven mad by their success, and this family had money and power. If you were the betting kind, you might have bet that death would eventually show up. You'd have won that bet. In the Roaring Twenties, the family embraced the money and power previously mentioned and so adorned themselves and their property with the usual ornaments of wealth. Expensive cars, jewelry, luxury furniture, exotic travel, parties, politics, fig leaf covered proclivities, and the true measure of persons of means, servants, maids, cooks, drivers, groundspeople, and a particularly good looking and well mannered butler, technically a major domo. This gentleman was well traveled, graceful, and entertaining. He was intimate with the lives of the family and knew their secrets, their fears, their hopes, and their desires. Inevitably, close attachments were formed. So it was that when the head of the household, a brutal, lascivious man known for his womanizing, was out of state on business, the wife and the butler became close. This state of affairs persisted for some time until the husband was informed by a friend of the goings-on. He flew into a rage and ran out of his study straight into the butler's quarters. There, he savagely beat the man into unconsciousness and dragged him out the front door, throwing him into the yard. Next, he secured a heavy rope from the garage and dragged the butler through the side streets adjacent to the property to a bridge whose side face could be seen clearly standing in the main door of the mansion. He tied the rope around the butler's neck, tired the rope to bridge, then pushed the butler off, breaking his neck and killing him. He left the butler swinging so all in the household would see. The usual scandal ensued. An arrest, the newspapers, a public outcry, a trial, the behind-the-scenes effects of money and power, and a not-guilty verdict due to inflamed passions driving the poor man to a temporary act of insanity. A divorce, a decline, and a disappearance from memory are the epitaphs. Yet, perhaps not, it is said that in the fall, when the air is cold with a damp earth chill and the leaves are brown and their papery whispers fill the surrounding woods close to the bridge, a creaking sound can be heard. Creak stop, creak stop, creak stop. If you are under the bridge on the opposite side from the hanging and the full moon is rising in the east, a faint rainbow ice ring, 
you can see a shape hanging from the bridge, swinging slowly from side to side. You have to be under the bridge to see the swinging shape, but people driving across the bridge have occasionally claimed to see a well-dressed man standing on the sidewalk in the middle of the night. The house is still standing to this day. A collection of white shapes like teeth sticking out of the hill, surrounded by the dark trees gazing forever on the bridge and remembering. I don't know to this day exactly what I saw that night camping in LBL, land between the lakes, in western Kentucky. Anyway, this happened a bit over two decades ago, as I said at LBL. My dad hunted there regularly, mainly bow hunting, and while I never was a hunter, I loved camping in the woods. We never used any formal campsite back then, we'd drive along the trace, turn off onto one of the numerous side roads, and then, near a creek bed, usually dry or just a small trickle from a spring, unless it had rained, we had our usual campsite. We pulled the car off the road, set up the tent, tarp it all over angled, and dad would do his thing while I would do mine. Typically, if I went with him, that meant, and this time as well, he'd trek off to his stand and would be gone most of the day. While he was off, I'd hike a bit, LBL, while big, is not a place one could easily get lost in if you have basic survival skills, read, or just relax. For me, it was a place to go to get away from it all, get lost in nature, or read a good sci-fi book. This time, this early morning, he had left after a quick breakfast, a chill and dampness in the air, the smell of fall coming in. Any of the outdoor types will understand the smell of wet leaves during the fall. I mention this only as it will be relevant later. Anyway, dad had left, and I whittled some on the hickory staff I had made before heading out for a very early morning hike. I set off in the usual direction, opposite from the road we were nearby, mostly following near the creek but not along it directly. I had a compass if I needed it, but I never did. I had grown up in the Jackson Purchase, and it was home. I loved nature and never felt uncomfortable out in the woods. Before long, however, cresting a small hill, I heard rustling among the trees. While the leaves were starting to fall, most were still up, falling at their prettiest. I slowed only for a moment, I'm used to those sounds of squirrels, typically bounding from tree to tree. But then it got louder and heavier, unlike any sound I've heard trees make outside of them breaking under ice or age. It was hard to focus on the sound, like it was coming from all around me, but not, and every direction I turned, I saw trees in the distance shaking, as if something large just jumped from them, but I saw nothing else. Then, I was probably 15, and despite years of being in the woods for many of them, I felt something I never really had before. Fear. Not terror, that would come later, but actual fear. Almost as soon as it started, the rattling, violent shaking of trees focused, not in a ring around me, on one before me. Opposite of the direction of camp, and then nothing. No sound at all. Not quiet, but an absence, almost. Somehow, that relaxed me. I had been exposed to that stillness before, and while the violent rustling of multiple trees felt alien, this was familiar. I thought about going back until I saw, in the distance, near the last tree that shook, a slim, dark figure. I couldn't make her out, somehow I felt it was her, but she was up near the ridge ahead, and I felt compelled to head to her, and I did. I know that sounds crazy, and typing it down now, I still do, but then I rationalized it as I wonder if she heard all that too. Perhaps she saw what it was. But as I walked towards her, she slid away, staying just barely visible among the trees. The sky was just starting to really lighten up, that transition from dawn to morning. And slide was the right word, I felt. She moved what appeared to be normally, but the distance she seemed to cover was unnatural. I'm over six feet tall, but my strides covered half the distance hers did, and she seemed normal-sized, as normal-sized as a dark, featureless shape could be. I mean, I could see a head, arms, and legs in what appeared to be dark but normal clothing, but I couldn't track her. Focusing on her was hard, and outside of knowing it was her, I could tell nothing else as she disappeared and reappeared among the trees, a couple hundred yards ahead of me, walking slowly yet somehow covering distances at running speeds. Again, I don't know why I followed her, but I did, down a hill, through some fog, until I neared a clearing. I lost sight of her as I neared it, and things got darker, like when the sun crawls behind a dense cloud, except there were none that I could see, though the sun was still too low for me to catch. The familiar stillness was there, but that didn't bother me. It was the smell that did. Every step closer to the clearing, I noticed it more and more, and though I couldn't find her and desperately wanted to find her, it sent alarm bells through me. I've been in the woods hundreds of times, both before and since. One thing I have never experienced since that weekend was the complete absence of smell. Nature has a smell, not a stink, but one that is distinct. One of decay and life, of plants and trees and creeks and stagnant ponds. And while, 
depending on where you are, you may or may not smell the same smells, there always is. Except there was nothing. That lack slowed me, stopped me, and only then did I see her across the clearing, looking at me. I wish I could say she was giant and hairy, or alien gray. She looked normal. She was instinctive and unmemorable, except for her smile. When she smiled, I ran. I had been scared before, with the trees out in the middle of LBL. But the lack of any smell, sound, or smile terrified me, and I ran. I was crying and terrified, and I had no idea why I should be. I stopped about halfway back, and everything was brighter, and despite my terror, I still wanted to turn back. I did look back, and though she was just a shape again, she was there, closer, freezing as I spotted her. I felt a smile again, but one I did not see, and I ran all the way back to the tent. I got in it and cried, shaking in a terror I did not and could not understand. I stayed in the tent until my dad got back, and I didn't tell him about it. By then, the terror had faded, and while I couldn't explain it, I knew something horrible would have happened had I gone into the dark clearing that had no smells or sounds. By night, I had almost convinced myself I had half imagined it all when, stepping away from the tent to pee, that stillness came over and I froze. I looked among the trees but saw nothing until I saw two reddish lights moving in the distance. I knew the terrain and knew it had to be uphill for me, but the eyes were descending. I felt her in the sense that I had felt it was a woman earlier, coming my way, and I felt a smile that was not a smile, even though I could not see it. I ran back to the tent, and my dad was there, staring into the fire. When I yelled at him, he just sat there, not responding. I shook him, feeling those eyes, that her behind, and then even the fire had no smell to it. It was just nothing. I shook my dad harder, screaming at him, and then suddenly, the fire was crackling, I could smell the smoke, and the stillness was gone. My dad asked me what the hell I was yelling about, and when I told him, he gave me that look I mentioned, that sideways glance that said, are you okay? After much pressure, we left, and while I barely held it together, as soon as I got in my room at our house, I cried. Not because I had embarrassed myself, but because of relief. I knew for a fact, had I not reached my dad and had not shook him, that I would have wandered off in the dark. Just like I would have wandered off in the morning, following her. She wanted me in that clearing, which felt wrong and smelled of nothing, and I wonder and have wondered so many nights what would have happened. I probably and hopefully will never have an answer, I just pray I never see or feel her again. I've been in the woods since then, both near there and in other woods, and never have I felt that way again. But still, every time the woods get quiet, I get scared. That was the most terrifying experience of my life, and I had to get it out. The Oz effect really struck a chord with me, as I've experienced it several times. My family owns a large amount of what is basically forest. It was settled at one time, but the people living there gave up as it's not good farmland, mainly rocks, etc. So now it has a few old log buildings left, slowly being reclaimed by the land. My dad loves nature and always explained everything about it to me. I was told there is nothing to be afraid of in the woods, as bears, being the only large predators in the area, are just as scared of you as you are of them. This personal experience is perfectly true. When I have encountered them, they are happy to go off in opposite directions, and that is that. On several occasions in the woods on walks by myself, I have experienced the complete absence of sound, like a stillness has taken hold of the area. It was almost as if time had slowed to allow me to further enjoy my surroundings. I would describe this as a peaceful feeling 90% of the time. One time I experienced this sudden absence of all sound but felt dread and unease, and something instinctively told me that I didn't want to go further down that path today. So I returned to the truck and went home. I personally believe that the human brain has more to do with this than the paranormal. When the mind perceives a threat, I think it may have the ability to sort of hyperfocus, making you unaware of anything but the threat that may or may not exist. I am currently in New Mexico. I have been hiking in the Oregon Mountains a lot the past couple weeks, particularly both the Dripping Springs and Pine Tree Trails. I became fixated on the Boyd Sanatorium, its presence really spoke to me, it was off the Dripping Springs trial, and I ended up stealth camping in the actual sanatorium for two nights. While stealth camping at the sanatorium, I kept having the same vivid dream about a large cave that I saw higher in the Oregon Mountains when I first hiked the Pine Tree Trail. A massive, prehistoric looking bird would fly out of the cave, swoop down on me, and fly me back up to the cave entrance. The bird then pecks and bites at me, forcing me deeper into the cave. There is a big pile of human bones. I think the bird eats people, and I expect that I might be next. I see something that looks out of place among the bones. It is a skull made of crystal, and I pick it up. I hear a loud and truly awful scream, maybe the bird? And I wake up. 
I go back to sleep, and the same dream restarts. All night and every night I stealth camped at the sanatorium, it was the same dream. Even knowing I was likely going to dream the same dream and trying to become lucid in the dream, I could not do it. I wanted so much to investigate the cave and the skull in greater detail, but I was stuck in that repeating dream as is, with no difference as far as I can tell. The last night, I stealth camped at the sanatorium. I woke from the dream as usual, but this time I caught a glimpse of something. It was very tall and thin, and she was watching me. I am over 6 feet tall, I would guess maybe it was near 7 feet tall and around 50 feet away from me. It was early morning, near 6 am, and it was just starting to lighten up. I do not know what it was, but when I saw it, it quickly moved back around the sanatorium. I got up. I am no coward. I ran after it. I was prepared for a fire in the sky or a communion-like alien encounter, but, thankfully, I got nothing. It was gone. I searched for almost an hour, but I found nothing. I have not stealth camped there since. What I decided to do instead was go see the cave from my reoccurring dream near the pine tree trail. I stayed the night in the campgrounds at the foot of the trail head, and for the next two days I hiked around the trail. I asked the people I ran into what they knew about the cave, and other than that, it was a cave, nothing more. Since hiking in the Oregon Mountains, I've come to enjoy taking pictures of all the tarantula, I've never seen so many, and that is what I was doing when it happened. It was near 7 p.m. I was wandering back from the primitive campground situated at the halfway point on the Pine Tree Trail loop. It was getting dark, and I was using the flashlight on my cell phone. I spotlighted a big, the biggest I've seen, tarantula making its way across the trail. I started to prepare the camera when I realized I couldn't move. I was very confused. I wanted to move, I wanted my finger to push the camera icon on my phone, I wanted to look around and see what the hell was going on, but I could not move. I was frozen, and I still cannot wrap my mind around it. I've had sleep paralysis, and it was sort of like that, but I've fought my way out of it. This was different. I couldn't get any momentum to start fighting against it. I can't say exactly how long I was in that state, a minute, maybe, but not much more. I don't get scared, really, but this had me going that way for sure. What happened next definitely pushed me way into sacred. Something, I don't know what, started to lift me off the ground. There was no light beam, no rope, nothing. It was like the bird in my dream, but with no talons and not even a goddamn bird. I made up my mind, right then and there, that no way in ducking hell was I going to get, get, by whatever it was. I started getting furiously mad, and from deep inside me, like, I took a psychic journey to my very center, that's the only way I can describe it, to discover any reason, any excuse, for me not to get taken away. I must have found one. I strained and strained, and eventually I found a mental foothold to start pushing against. Little by little, I started to effectively resist the paralysis. I was suddenly dropped, maybe three or four feet, to the ground and on my stomach. I am not sure how one grabs the earth, but that is what I did. Something was still attempting to lift me. I thrashed and rolled around hard. I was in a real fight with something. I kept looking up, but I couldn't see anything. That was the worst part of it. Had it been a drone or a massive bird, I could set my mind against it and focus my rage on it. Something was there, but outside my perception. Cloaked? Maybe, I don't know. This lasted a couple minutes more, me wrestling against a force intended to lift me. I think had I remained paralyzed, it would not have dropped me. I believe it wanted to stay locked onto me in case it could paralyze me again. Maybe that is why certain people are found dead from injuries that indicate they died from a fall, because they did fall. Maybe they fought through the paralysis, and whatever was dropped on them was just from a far greater height than me. The very tangible feeling of being lifted finally ceased, and I made like a terrified rabbit down the trail to the camping area. I was exceedingly happy to see that a few other people were camping as well. I was in no condition to drive, I was just too emotionally and physically shaken. I did not sleep much, and what little I did, I do not remember dreaming. I will absolutely find my way into that cave, but on my own terms, or maybe by way of a massive bird, but I need to actually see the bird. There is a chemical that keeps you paralyzed in your sleep. Could whatever this is, through the use of frequency, maybe overstimulate the production of that chemical to paralyze people? Was the dream something to just lead me there? I believe that whatever I saw at the Boyd Sanatorium plays a role in this. But why wouldn't it just get me then? Are there any cases in the missing 411 accounts about someone being drawn to a place or dreaming of a place, and that is where they went missing? Maybe my experience will help someone else. I hope so. Today was a little rough. I keep thinking it will happen again, and I am considering leaving New Mexico, but then again, why couldn't it happen somewhere else? That is also something that really bothers me too.
At first, these things seem to have been relegated to national parks, but there are urban cases that draw parallels, especially those being carried away. So I might just be ducked. Anyway, if this helps anyone, I will be happy for it.